Uh, right, we're now live. Good morning, Tim. Um, are you okay for me to start the meeting now? I don't think it's quite 11, is it? Or uh, we have to start at no, 11. It's one, yeah, it's one minute to, but we are we are live now, so you can start start as soon as the clock hits 11. Okay, so if if you just tell me when you when it's a, when it's actually 11 o'clock, and then we'll start. Okay. <clears throat> Right, you are clear. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Performance Management Scrutiny Committee. I'm Claire Weil, Chairman of the committee. I am obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee member experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they've already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use it for anything else so that it is clear who's asking to speak and the debate has to be heard by those listening to the audio feed. As chair, I will interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of the remote participation with advice from the monitoring officer prior to making a ruling. At the start of the meeting, I will ask members of the committee to confirm their presence and any disclosable pecuniary interest they have in any of the items on the agenda. I will ask everyone that speaks during the meeting, including members of the committee and officers, to introduce themselves each time they speak. This is so that the people listening know who's speaking. I'm now going to do a roll call and disclosable pecuniary interests. Members are reminded to disclose any pecuniary interest in any matter to be discussed which is not included in the register of interests and leave the meeting prior to the matter being discussed. I'm now going to read out each member's name and ask them to confirm their presence and confirm if they have any interests. My name's Claire Wild. I'm here and I have no pecuniary interests. Joyce Barrow. I'm here and no interests. Thank you. Karen Calder. I'm here, no pecuniary interest. Thank you. Roger Evans. Present and no pecuniary interest. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Hannah. Present and no pecuniary interest. Um, I'm a twin hatted um, member of Shrew Shrewsbury Town Council as well. Thank you. Alan Mosley. I believe Alan Mosley isn't here and I don't believe he has a substitute um, Cecilia Motley. 
Yeah, and um, no pecuniary interest. And I'm going to turn my camera off, Chair, because my, my um, connection isn't very good. OK. Thank you. Peggy Mullet. Here and no pecuniary interest. Right. OK, thank you. Um, Dave Tremellan is being substituted by Pauline D. So, Pauline, are you here? Yes, I'm here. And Hello, did you hear me? I'm here and I have no pecuniary interest. Right, OK, thank you. Uh, and uh, Leslie Winwood. I'm, I'm here. Um, just just checking, Chairman, um, just to make sure um, I do work for sports and schoolwear shops. So um, how does that come within the bounds of? OK, can I just ask Claire Porter? Um, yes, this is Claire Porter, Director of Legal and Democratic Services and the Monitoring Officer for the Council. I'm not aware that there's any item uh, that's particular to you, Les, and your your conflict that you may feel you have. But if you do, uh, if the debate does go that way and you feel you've <coughs> put anything in your register of interests that you feel uh, could um, taint uh, your views, then you need to indicate to the chair and leave the meeting. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Uh, I now turn to agenda item one, which is apologies. To receive any apologies for absence and substitutions. Can the committee officer confirm if there are any apologies and substitutions? Uh, there's been apologies from Alan Mosley and Councillor Dave Tremellan. Councillor Pauline D is here as substitute for Councillor Tremellan. Right, OK, thank you. Item number two is disclosable pecuniary interests, and that's been dealt with with the roll call. Item number three, to confirm the minutes of the performance management scrutiny meeting held on the 10th of May 2020. I move the minutes of the performance management scrutiny meeting held on the 10th of May 2020 as circulated with the agenda papers and ask that they be signed as a correct record. Can I have a seconder, please? Second, Councillor Cecilia Motley. Thank you. Uh, I will now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone else indicates differently. Sorry, it, you said the 10th of May. It says on the 20th of May on the um, on the uh, minutes of the virtual meeting on agenda item three. Julie. Apologies, you... it is the 20th of May. Right. Please accept our apologies and thank you very much, Pauline, for being so on the ball. So I'm going to do that again. I move the minutes of the performance management scrutiny meeting held on the 20th of May 2020 as circulated with the agendas. And I ask these to be signed as a correct record. Can I have a seconder, please? Second, Councillor Cecilia Motley. Thank you. I'll now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone else indicates differently. No, OK, thank you very much. I now move on to item number four, public question time. No public questions have been received. I now move on to item number five, which is members questions. Um, and if I could call on uh, uh, Ruth Houghton to ask her question. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Ruth Houghton, Bishop's Castle. I'd like to ask the following question. As there has not been a health overview and social care scrutiny meeting for some time, may I use this opportunity to ask the following question. Carers working across the social care sector in Shropshire have been critical key workers during the current coronavirus situation. <clears throat> the care sector has also experienced difficulty in recruiting staff. What opportunities and prospects are there for Shropshire Council to fund and deliver the real living wage of £9.30 per hour, adequate and enlightened pension provision and associated attractive employment terms and conditions to all carers? Right, OK, so I, we didn't get the last bit of your bit of your question, Ruth. You, if you if you just read out the bit after you said the real living wage of nine thirty per hour. So, uh, 
share that section was what opportunities and prospects are there for Shropshire Council to fund and deliver the real living wage of £9.30 per hour, adequate and enlightened pension provision and associated attractive employment terms and conditions to all carers working within the Shropshire Social Care Network. OK, thank you very much, Ruth. So this is uh, Councillor Claire Wilde as chair. I will read out the response. Shropshire's rates recognise the element of UK Home Care Association rates for care workers at contact and travel time, national insurance and pension contributions. They also recommend 1% sick pay and mileage costs as per model identified by the uh, UK Homes Care Association due to the rurality of the county. Using this calculation, the minimum rate of pay to meet these costs works out at 14.85 per hour. The current top rate for domiciliary care in Shropshire is £19.20, with the minimum rate being increased to 16.50, and there is therefore considerable considered sufficient to meet the increased costs generated by the 6.2% national living wage increase and still allow for a variety of running costs according to different business sizes. In addition, on the 1st of April 2020, the new standard personal assistant rate will increase from 8.62 to 9.30 an hour. In regard to the annual inflation uplift for domiciliary care, a great deal of preparation and consideration has gone into the offer that was made to the market this year. It is important to note that Shropshire Council's rates for domiciliary care have been and continue to be higher than other authorities in the region. In addition to this, when setting out the rates for this year, we looked into consideration for the limited resources that the council has for adult social care. Shropshire Partners in Care have received funding from Skills for Care to support the market with a programme focusing on recruitment and retention, including training workshops and recruitment events. We continue to engage closely with providers, supporting them with these and other challenges. We are carrying out weekly welfare and support calls to both domiciliary care and care home providers who are reporting a, a renewed interest in careers as a carer and an upturn in recruitment and hold regular provider forums. The next one taking place virtually on the 18th of June 2020. Do you have a supplementary question, Ruth? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, for a very comprehensive response. Um, I note the, the minimum rate and the top rate of £19.20 being paid per hour to care providers. Presumably that is to the actual care provider. Is there any evidence of what wage rate the actual carer receives? And is it £9.30 per hour? OK, I'm going to have to ask somebody for an answer to that question. Um, can so I, just... I could help. Right, OK, sorry, Andy Begley, would you like to introduce yourself and answer the question? Yeah, Andy Begley, uh, currently interim, uh, acting interim chief executive Shropshire Council, uh, also hold the statutory position of director of adult services at Shropshire Council. Um, just to help with that uh, answer, Ruth, um, I think it would be right that we get back to you with a, a detailed response to that. I don't want to give any misleading information to the committee. Um, but I think it's right to say that we are in contact with uh, providers, particularly through the umbrella organisation Shropshire Partners in Care, uh, and we try to work with very closely with those providers and understand what their uh, current payments are to their frontline staff. So perhaps if I could get that information uh, to you outside of this, Ruth. Um, thank you, that would be really appreciated. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. So we now move on to Councillor David Mas Asma. Could you read your question, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Since the council meeting in December, when a timetable was agreed to generate an action plan on climate change, what progress has been made given the understandable interruption that COVID-19 has caused? Has a proposed partnership advisory group been set up? Thank you, David. OK, I shall reply. Steady progress has been made towards the objective of publishing a corporate climate strategy and action plan. Although there have been some delays due to the need to prioritise staff resources to meet the challenges posed by flooding and COVID-19, officers now plan to present a draft document for consideration by Cabinet in September. However, the Council has firmly adopted the principle of don't stop acting just because you're planning, and actions have therefore continued across a range of other initiatives, including guidance on a range of committee reports and corporate construction, transport and renewable energy projects. projects sorry. Officers are also working closely with representatives of the Green Shropshire Exchange and other local environmental groups to identify potential actions to improve carbon performance across the whole of Shropshire and develop, develop proposals for a climate action partnership which will also include Telford and Rekin. As part of this joint work, Shropshire Council has just commissioned the Centre for Sustainable Energy to carry out stakeholder mapping, which will inform the structure and participation in a Shropshire-wide stakeholder partnership. Have you got a supplementary question? Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Just uh, one, thank you very much for that. Um, the draft document is coming in September. I'd, I'd hope really it'd be a bit earlier than that. It seems a long time to wait for it. But secondly, I noticed that on your work plan, you've got um, climate change bit as a topic um, on in July. And I was hoping that perhaps that um, the documents that were mentioned in your response could be actually published at that meeting so that we can actually see what guidance, extra guidance has been given, um, and extra developments. Um, and also, I think there'll be a lot of public interest at that meeting. And I was a bit concerned at this one that uh, member questions are restricted to six. So um, will you know a large number of members of the public perhaps be able to ask questions and will more members be able to ask questions? Because I think this is a highly topical debate and I think there'll be a lot of interest in that. OK, thank you, David. Um, can I ask um, one of the officers to get back and answer David's question? I can make sure that's picked up, Chair. Thank you. Claire, okay. can I? This is Councillor Dean Carroll, portfolio holder. Can I can I answer at least the first part of the question about the, the timeline, please, with your with your permission? Yes, of course, Dean. Yes, carry on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Um, in terms of the date for the draft, if what you said at the start of your question is perfectly right, if it wasn't for the flooding and COVID-19 pandemic, these draft papers would have come out, would have been produced in for the July Council meeting. However, understandably, we have had to redeploy staff to critical functions uh, and this has taken, I'm not going to say a backseat because that would be the wrong word, but the, the work on the strategy has taken a uh, secondary importance. But the work on the projects to reduce the carbon footprint is absolutely still being prioritised. I'd just like to make that clear that yes, you're quite right. If it wasn't for COVID-19 and the flooding before that, those papers would have, would have been intended to have come to July's council. Uh, is that OK, David? Uh, yes, that's fine. I look forward to a more detailed response on the other matters. Thanks very much. OK, and can I just um, and can I just say that um, Karen Calder has asked that um, Ruth's supplementary question, the answer that Andy Begley is going to send out, can he send out to all members? Yes, noted. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Sorry, the next question is from Viv Parry. Is Viv Parry here? Yes, I'm here. Sorry Which? about that. Press the wrong button. No, that's all right. Wait a minute, I'll do it again. 
unmuted. There we are. I'm getting used to this now. Thank you very much. My question is about roadside verges. In spring, we have all been treated to a delightful display of wildflowers on our road verges. But in the last 10 days, they have been mowed in and trimmed into oblivion. The verges are now, now nothing other than a, a, a patch of very dried up uh, earth and grass. Most of the wildflowers have not had time to reseed from last year. Why do we do this? As a driver, I know that safety is vital. We must mow the edges of the roads and the corners to ensure that drivers can see and drive safely. Every year, verges and areas that don't need to be mowed for safety reasons are mowed. This council seems to be carrying on regardless. We need our wildflowers desperately. Mowing costs this, mowing costs this council money at a time when we are always trying to balance our budget. Why can't we mow less and promote biodiversity at the same time? Can officers bring forward a policy for reducing the mowing of roadside verges and any other areas the council mows? At the same time, can the council tell everyone why we are not why we are not mowing these areas? That doesn't sound right. At the same time, can the council tell everyone why we are not mowing these areas? And that's for the future that we are that we are trying to help the planet. Thank you. And Vivian Parry and the Shropshire Council for Ludlow South, by the way, I forgot to do that. And I'm also a town councillor for the uh, for Ludlow Town Council. OK, thank you very much, Viv. So the answer to your question, the question rightly raises the importance of Shropshire's 5000 kilometres of diverse and valued verges. I regret the points raised are not site specific, therefore I'm unable to provide specific specific site specific responses. It is, however, widely known we have been consulting with other authorities looking at best practice, such as with the Wildlife Trust excellent advice document managing road verges, alongside exploring operational options for a much more refined approach to verge maintenance, balancing safety, wildlife and nature. The competitive environment created by nature and the dominance of problem specific species such as ragwort mean it is not as simple as mowing and mowing is not automatically a bad thing. Shropshire can look forward to a more diverse verge network in the future, building on the work we've already done, such as the reinstatement of the ditching and culvert maintenance, which has transformed miles of ditches already this year restoring a long lost wildlife habitat. So far this year, we have already reinstated 30 kilometers of rural highway ditches in South Shropshire. Shropshire can look forward to a comprehensive paper on the subject within the current financial year. Have you got a supplementary question, Viv? Yes, I don't know whether you'll think it's a supplementary question, but I'd like to say that the roadside verges I'm talking about are the ones I walk past every day and because people are have been locked down now they're coming out for walks uh, and most of the verges are on those walks which are in the town or just on the outskirts like the eco park. I, I really honestly think that when I went and asked the, the people that were doing the job and they said oh they were all dead the wildflowers they weren't dead they were just trying to reseed themselves. And really, if we hadn't, if we could have left them a bit longer, they would have reseeded. And as soon as we got some rain, they'd have been a lot better. So I really am asking this council to look in the towns because the town verges where people are walking are the most important things. OK, thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure officers will take that into consideration when they do their report later in the year. Thank you. We move on now to question number four. Uh, the question actually was from Councillor Heather Kidd. She's unable to be here. So Ruth Houghton has kindly agreed to read out the question for her. Um, Ruth Houghton, Bishop's Council Councillor. Um, thank you, Chair, for allowing the nomination. Um, the question from Councillor Heather Kidd is, 
is how many homes in total have been infected across the county since the COVID-19 outbreak? How many are infected today and how many individuals in total have been infected? OK, thank you. Reporting on care homes is not collated in a way to specifically answer the question. However, the response below seeks to answer the question. The Office of National Statistics data shows the number of care homes reporting a suspected or confirmed outbreak of public COVID-19 to Public Health England together with the cum cumulative proportion of all care homes that have reported an outbreak, two or more suspected cases. These are included each week from the 2nd of March 2020 to the 3rd of June 2020, and this shows that 41 out of our 120 care homes have reported an outbreak. That's 34.2%. We are aware of one additional care home confirmed as an outbreak after this date in an additional setting. We are currently supporting seven ongoing situations. Reporting does not provide a cumulative count of cases, um, but at a point in time, data will be reported by care homes directly to the CQC. In addition, all care homes in Shropshire are working through a program of testing all staff and residents. Symptomatic and asymptomatic. These results are now starting to come in and will provide us with a fuller picture of those residents and staff who will be identified. And we will have a further picture of this at a point in time within homes. Now, do you have a supplementary for Heather, Ruth? Um, yes, if I may, Chair, we, we did discuss um, this earlier, um, Councillor Kill and myself, and we're particularly concerned regarding um, people, well, of all residents in care homes who are all vulnerable, but the under 65 age group of people with learning disabilities who are particularly vulnerable and who um, usually have poor outcomes in the rest of the health, or, or, poor health outcomes in the rest of the health um, of the rest of the population and generally poorer experiences in hospital and we wondered if there is any possibility of getting that split of numbers down to over 65s and under 65s and if there's any additional support being provided to those most vulnerable people with learning disabilities. Okay thank you Ruth. Can I ask Andy to come back? I'm sorry, I might have missed that, Claire. Did you invite me to speak? Yes, please. Yes. Sorry, it's uh, Andy Begley. Um, just in response to to that question, uh, Ruth. As you know, um, people, adults with learning disabilities, um, uh, separate, if we can say, from the over sixty five population that we're generally referring to here, uh, it is something that I can report um, that the STP, that's the partnership between uh, health services and ourselves. Uh, are looking at this particular group in relation to C19 and the transmission of the virus. Um, there is ongoing work around that. The, so, so that's a sort of a piece of reassurance that I can give here and now. In terms of those numbers, um, that the only numbers that we could provide are those that we're providing a service for between those different age groups uh, in terms of uh, particularly with looking at learning disability services or, or, or older adult services more generally. What it won't provide, however, uh, is I think the breakdown that's being requested here in terms of any of those uh, outbreaks that we're talking about. In relation to the monitoring of those outbreaks and recording of those, they are happening on a, a kind of a daily basis, if you like. Uh, and as the original response indicated, uh, they're being managed primarily through uh, reporting through the CQC um, and uh, through health services and public health nationally reporting on the national position and then that's fed down to us. So it'd be very difficult, uh, nigh impossible, I think, to provide the information I think Ruth you're requesting um, other than just a, a, a split in terms of that age group uh, and in terms of those particular cohorts. Thank you. OK, thank you. Are you content with that, Ruth? Um, I appreciate it's very difficult, um, but I'm also aware, as um, the director is aware too, of how the how people with learning disabilities um, tend to be treated 
less well um, for health and for hospital admissions. And I think it's an area of concern that I'm pleased yes, and I'm pleased to hear that the STP are looking at this as to just how many people with learning disabilities are affected by this virus whenever there is a review in the future of how people have been supported. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to question number five, Roger. Thank you, Claire. This is Roger Evans, uh, councillor for the London Division. Um, in question five, I see there's a, a word missed out. I will highlight that as I go through it, but I hope the implications of it was not missed in the answer. There is much talk about putting in place recovery plans and note a press release was re issued recently by the leader of Shropshire Council concerning the setting up of two groups of Conservative councillors to look into this. Despite efforts to work cross party, and the word no should have been inserted in that, and my apologies it wasn't. Despite efforts to work cross party, no members from the second largest group of councillors appear to have been included. The press report also included the statement, others were to be invited. <laughs> Who will they be and what sectors will they be from? We are now in the recovery phase with many businesses opening on June the 15th. What help is Shropshire Council going to provide for them, both in the immediate and the longer term? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Roger. Well, I've got quite a lengthy reply here. The council made an extensive effort since the outbreak of COVID-19 to ensure that we get a lot of interference. If anybody's not speaking, that's it. Thank you. It's sorted now. I'll start again. The council has made an extensive effort since the outbreak of COVID-19 to ensure a broad spectrum of business support and engagement. This has included the promotion and distribution of government cash grants and advice and support to many of Shropshire's businesses throughout both the March's Growth Hub and the teams within the Council, including economic growth and regulatory services. The Council has been working closely with key stakeholders and business organisations throughout this period, with representatives from a cross-section of sectors, including Shropshire Business Board, March's LEP, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Chamber of Commerce and the NFU, amongst others. As lockdown measures have eased and a timeline became clear about the reopening of non-essential retail businesses on the 15th of June. In addition to continuing the responses and management of further grants throughout the extended funds, over 700 applications in the first week, Officers have also been preparing plans for the reopening of these businesses and our market towns. This work has been across departments with a multi-team approach to offer support and advice to businesses and working with town councils and business organisations, including the business improvement districts, to help with the immediate measures of reopening. A digital guide is being prepared that will be published at the weekend to offer businesses a simple, clear resource for information and advice in one place. Letters have been sent out to businesses with lots of information about where to go for support for their reopening, including our internal regulatory services team. And we continue to meet regularly with business organisations to ensure that we are aware of business issues and concerns and get key messages out via these channels. The development of our economic and social recovery plans will be key to the longer term work to support businesses and our communities. Lots of data has started to be gathered, but to begin to inform this from a number of sources, it will be key for us to form a clear picture of the impacts based on evidence. We feed this through the March's LEP directly into central government. We will continue to involve business representations and key partners in this work going forward. The Council is leading two informal working groups set up to address the coronavirus 
economic recession. The Economic Task, task Force will address economic impacts and the Social Task Force will help to mitigate the social impacts our citizens and communities have felt. The membership has been drawn down from across a variety of the public, private and third sector organisations. The Economic Task Force will look at how to support local businesses and the local economy through the recession, while the Social Task Force will look at such issues including universal credit and housing. Both task force meet for the first time next week. The economic task force involves a number of partners listed, uh, but specifically the chair of the Shropshire Business Board, the chief executive of the Marches LEP, the chief executive of Shropshire Chamber of Commerce, the Department of Works and Pensions representative, the local federation of small business representatives, educational representatives, including the University Centre Shrewsbury and a college, Shrewsbury College representative. S uh, sector representatives, including visitor economy, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, professional services and voluntary sector. Do you have a supplementary question, Roger? Yes, I do, Chairman, and sorry, I was unmuting myself. Roger Evans, uh, Shropshire Cancer again. I note the two task groups that have been set up, and they comprise five Conservatives on each. <coughs> we have tried to work cross-party, but all opposition councillors are being excluded. I note that the Chairman of the Shropshire Parish and Town Council Movement has been invited to the social uh, task group who actually comes from Telford and Narekin. Why can't it continue to be cross-party so that all groups are aware of where we're going, what we want to do? I could use a phrase and I'm, fr I'm afraid I will use it because the majority mm -hmm. of other local authorities are doing it cross-party. Are we failing to plan or planning to fail? Because if we don't involve all councillors, there will be so all sorts of arguments start to percolate through. And we all need to understand how we can take Shropshire forward together. OK, thank you, Roger. Um, I think that's a question that you're going to have to take up. To. Can you turn your mic off, please, Roger? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, it's just there's a lot of interference when you when you don't turn your mic off. OK, so I think that's a question that you're going to have to take up with uh, the leader of the council, Peter Nutting. What I will say is, though, um, that um, obviously all these groups need cabinet members on them because the cabinet members are obviously involved with the visitor economy, economic growth. And so it is absolutely right that Shropshire Council cabinet members sit on this group. But I will leave it for the um, for the leader of the council Chair. to uh, give you a formal response. Chair, can I can I put some more flesh on the bones of what you said, please? Because the, there are some parts of that supplementary question that aren't entirely reflective of the situation. So, with your with your permission, can I put some more flesh on the bones of your? Um, very quickly, but I do think that this is a uh, this is a question for Peter Nutting to answer, Dean. Uh, absolutely, but I just want to say there is a cross-party oversight and governance committee being set up, which will be cross-party. OK, thank you, Dean. OK, Roger, uh, can you read out your next question, please? Question, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my next question is local outbreak control plans. <clears throat> How and what is Shropshire Council doing to tackle these? and ensure our residents feel safe at home. Various reports I have seen state this is being looked after by local authorities. Are they correct? And how is Shropshire Council taking this forward to ensure all staff and residents receive the help that is needed? This will of course include supply of PPE, training, testing, and the associated tracing of contacts. Thank you. OK, thank you. Oh, thank you, Roger, for muting. OK, so 
I will answer. Every upper tier local authority is required to have a local outbreak plan by the end of June 2020. These plans will centre on seven themes, which include testing and management of complex situations or outbreaks. Shropshire Council is currently drafting their outbreak control plan. As part of this plan, enhanced government arrangements are being put into place, including a member led local outbreak engagement group. Terms of reference are being drafted. In terms of response to outbreak, Shropshire Council has established a COVID-19 health protection cell who are working hand in hand with Public Health England to respond to any local suspected or confirmed outbreaks within Shropshire. Have you got a supplementary question, Roger? Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's, I note the member group and it is this and I would hope that this member group could comprise of cross party because we do need to work together so that we can cover all parts of Shropshire so, because when and if it does happen, I hope it doesn't, but when and if it does happen, we need to work together and we need to work together rapidly to decide what action needs to be taken. OK, thank you, Roger. So you've had confirmation from Dean that that is going to happen. So I take it you're happy. You're happy now, Roger, with the answer to your supplementary. Uh, I would accept it, but wait to see what happens. Thank you. OK, Chairman. thank you, Roger. So we now move on to agenda item seven. Uh, agenda item seven is schools operation during the COVID-19 pandemic. The officers present for this item are Karen Bradshaw, Phil Wilson and Steve Compton. They will introduce themselves, so I will pass over to Karen to, um, to go through this. As agreed earlier by all members of the committee, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to let Karen go through the whole of her presentation and then we'll take questions at the end. So I'll hand over to you, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Sorry for the delay in uh, unmuting there. Um, so um, as you um, have uh, rightly said, I've got two colleagues with me today who will introduce themselves as we uh, go through our presentation. Um, there's quite a lot um, in this presentation and inevitably there could have been other officers that we could have brought along today, um, but we felt that for simplicity and pragmatism, then um, we retain it. Re re um, uh, re um, just include the three of us, sorry about that. Um, so um, if we move on, Julie, onto the next slide, please. Um, just by way of some context here, just to set out what the uh, government have expected and set out their plans to local authorities. Um, and it seems such a long way back, doesn't it? Back in, uh, in late March, um, that um, the government um, asked all schools um, in all local authorities areas to provide um, provision for children of critical workers and vulnerable children. Um, so that was a good few weeks ago. Um, then on the 1st of June, um, uh, less, less, uh, less long ago, uh, primary schools were also asked to offer places for children in reception year one um, and year six pupils. And looking forward, the government has also asked secondary schools um, to increase their offer of contact to year 10 and year 12 pupils. So that's by way of context in, in terms of um, what the, the government has asked for us. So I'm going to hand over to Steve now to walk, walk through um, a few slides covering things like um, attendance at schools and the communication um, that, and actions that we've taken so far. So Steve, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Karen. Uh, Steve Compton, I'm the Principal School Improvement Advisor for Shropshire Council. Um, you should see on your screen uh, two graphs, and I'm not necessarily expecting you to be able to see the, the numbers along the side. Really, we're looking at trends. So uh, the graphs that you can see show the attendance in schools between the initial uh, closure of schools up until half term, so towards the end of May. On the, the left hand graph, we can see some orange bars and some dark blue bars. The dark blue bars are the national figures for attendance 
and the orange bars are the Shropshire attendance figures. If we looked at the trend, we can see that on the first day of the um, reduction in school opening, uh, and I'm using the, the words carefully because schools never closed, so we're not talking about school closures. Um, way back in March, we saw schools close to a number of year groups, um, but as Karen has already mentioned, vulnerable children and children of critical work is still attended. We saw on the first day attendance fall to around 5% and then very quickly following that we saw attendance fall around so around 1.5 uh, to 2%. I think the pleasing thing in that graph is we can see this across Shropshire we put in the provision that meant more children uh, as a percentage of the total in Shropshire attended than nationally. On the right hand side we can see vulnerable learners um, now, vulnerable learners are defined by either children with uh, an EHCP, education, healthcare plan, or children who have a social worker, and these will include looked after children. We can see that uh, when schools went through that initial um, closure to most year groups in late March, the attendance of these children was uh, very low. And we can see that through the work of um, schools and the work of LA officers, we can see that the numbers of vulnerable children has increased significantly. Um, I, I think way back in March, we were talking around 50 children across the authority. By uh, the end of May, we were talking of around <coughs> 250 children, 300 children. I've looked at the data for yesterday, and as of yesterday, we have 423 vulnerable children back in school. So we can see the amount of vulnerable children has uh, increased significantly. Next slide, Tim, please. As Karen has already mentioned, uh, last week we saw primary schools undergo a wider reopening. So the wider reopening was for reception children, year one and year six. We know that this was a difficult ask and what we've seen across the country, not just in Shropshire, is what we term a phased reintegration. Um, some schools would have prioritised reception children first and introduced year one, year six later. Other schools may have introduced rotors. We can see that as of Friday last week, we had 3,503 children in our Shropshire primary schools. To give some context to that, if we went back to before the 1st of June, our total attendance, including primary and secondary, was broadly around 1,300, 1,400. So we've seen over 2,000 children uh, more attend school last week. This continues to rise. I think by the end of yesterday, we had 4,987 children attending schools in Shropshire. We saw 80% of our schools, our primary schools, open to reception year one or year six. Uh, and we know that our attendance is broadly in line with national, perhaps just above national again now, uh, and that we saw 16.5% attend. We know that there will be some schools who have yet to open and their opening plans will indicate that they will aim to open by the end of this week or next week. Again, I checked yesterday um, and by the end of yesterday, we had gone from 80.3% of schools up to 93% of primary schools being open. And we'd expect that figure to continue to increase over the next week or so. Next slide, please, Tim. Thank you. Um, Obviously, in, in the unprecedented times that we're in, communication is, is paramount. And really, this slide reflects uh, the steps we've taken to make sure that communication, um, in terms of challenge and support, but also in terms of sharing the key messages, whether they're local messages or national messages, uh, the various channels that we've used. Uh, one of the things that we, we have done very successfully is we've emailed all schools every day we've done a, a daily head teacher update and we've tried to channel all communication with schools into that one email so that we're keeping a, a central communication channel going we've also ensured that the, the forums that, that, that normally meet so it's a central policy group um, 
uh, and our maintained schools head teacher forum that those meetings have continued. Likewise, we've ensured that um, we've offered all of our maintained head teachers one to one meetings. Again, the two key words we will use here, challenge and support. Very important that we support our head teachers, particularly in terms of their, their well-being at these very uncertain times, but also make sure we are asking to see what they're offering at a school level, understanding the issues they face and providing some challenge into what they're offering. Uh, we also meet regularly with the DfE and the Regional Schools Commissioner's Office. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, that was a, a daily meeting. We now have uh, two meetings per week, uh, and this is probably our, our main mechanism for uh, raising Shropshire based issues on a national platform. Next slide, please, Tim. I shan't go through um, all of the points on here, but I should just pull out one or two key points. Uh, I think one of the, the important things that we um, did early in the pandemic is we set up a parent helpline um, and the parent helpline really helped us to ensure that we were meeting the need for school places for children of critical workers and children um, who are vulnerable children. Uh, the helpline allowed us to find those places, not just in schools, but also in early years. And it's important to say that our early year settings have followed a very similar pattern to schools. So I think that, for example, yesterday we had around 85% of our early year settings open and most of those have stayed open during the, the pandemic. Um, in terms of vulnerable learners, you'll notice on the, the fourth bullet point down, um, the local authority uh, as a, a link between uh, education access, SEN team and social care created a VAG rating template. So all schools were asked to um, look at their vulnerable learners and carry out a VAG rating as to whether they should be in school or at home. Um, obviously, in the early days of the, the pandemic, the advice was clear that in most cases, children should be at home and were safer at home. We know that's not always the case. Uh, and as we've gone through the pandemic, we've worked hard to encourage and ensure that more children are back in school. And it's that RAG rating that allows us to challenge schools uh, and to see whether they're identifying the correct children for being at home or in school. Next slide, please, Tim. Moving forward, um, again, we've seen that wider reopening take place. Uh, we've reset up uh, and uh, republicised our parent helpline. Um, likewise, just before half term, we carried, we asked schools to carry out a risk assessment. This is maintain schools where, as a local authority, we are the employer and therefore it's our responsibility to um, quality assure a risk assessment in terms of being ready for that wider reopening. Time scales involved were very tight. Schools had three weeks notice of uh, reception year one and year six returning to school. That three weeks included half term, so effectively they had 14 days. Um, deadlines were very tight, uh, but all risk assessments were completed on time uh, and no school had to delay opening because of a late risk assessment. Uh, we know that one or two schools made the decision to move back their reopening date by one or two days. Um, but all of the risk assessments were completed by the date they were required. Um, next slide, please, Tim. Um, I'll hand over to Phil Wilson at this point, who can talk us through transport. You there, Phil? Phil? Can you unmute? I do beg your pardon, apologies. Uh, Phil Wilson, Service Manager for Business Support, Learning and Skills, part of Children's Services at Shropshire Council. Um, 
there's a bullet point on the last slide reference in terms of one of the actions taken in the lead up to schools uh, extending it opening from the uh, 1st of June and that was regarding some detailed uh, passenger transport advice, school transport advice. So really this slide just uh, builds on that a little bit. So that guidance was issued uh, to all uh, current providers for the transport providers and operators as well as our schools community. So that was detailed advice in terms of how we open up uh, the passenger transport provision uh, as a consequence of the extended opening. Um, I would say that the numbers of children uh, prior to um, the extended opening since lockdown on the 23rd of March, and, and it's been really mirrored in the pick up and the take up of transport since uh, schools extended opening on the 1st of June is mirroring the numbers of children in, in the in the schools community that Steve's just alluded to. So we're talking about uh, uh, one percentage point to one two percent points of, of children of critical workers and vulnerable children going into school prior to half term. But those numbers have clearly started to increase as more and more pupils are coming into schools. Uh, a lot of work involving uh, the passenger transport group in liaison with the schools to make sure that um, the transport provision was available for those children returning. Uh, now, on top of that, they are clearly working with our secondary colleagues now in terms of the return um, of year 10s and year 12s on a on a incremental basis from next uh, next Monday. So again, provision has been put in place uh, for those. Clearly, the guidance, uh, national guidance, is is uh, very detailed in terms of uh, social distancing, and so that has placed uh, significant. Uh, uh, restrictions in terms of how effectively the uh, we can manage the transport of our young people uh, both uh, to school and back from school. Um, so the detailed guidance really goes into detail on this and that, that information is available on the council website. Uh, so they're having to operate at 25 percent capacity. So if we talk about a 52 seat uh, we can probably carry only 13 children on that and similar sort of proportions on, on more, smaller transport. So again that's primarily down to the two meter social distancing. Very detailed diet guidance on how that is managed, how children unload and load onto the buses. Um, so very very detailed on that. Um, that capacity is manageable at the moment, um, but as we look ahead to September, and that clearly uh, we'll probably talk about that later, but we've got the key issue in terms of how we plan for wider opening of schools come September. 50% uh, capacity, if that was the target for September, uh, or there were some restrictions or change in the separation, would place uh, increase that capacity, but the 50% would still leave us with potential problems I've only been able to transport a third of our entitled pupils. So we'll need to think very creatively about how we do that. Are we doing uh, double trips or do we need to facilitate through our providers uh, additional transport? Key issues that we will need to watch the direction of travel and, and respond to appropriately. Uh, again, the team are ready and waiting for uh, additional guidance on that. Um, SEND transport, again, a key part of our responsibility. Again, we've been working with similar sort of parameters uh, to ensure that those uh, uh, those children are able to access provision, uh, but again, working within the same framework for others. At the end of last week, we got guidance in terms of face coverings uh, for public transport. Uh, the initial guidance didn't refer really to anything um, uh, that applying to home to school transport, but information coming out of yesterday's uh, uh, parliamentary session with the Secretary of State indicates that there might be an expectation that the face coverings on home to school transport may apply. So we've been waiting for further details on that. Uh, our position would be though that the measures we put in place for our schools, uh, the separation and all those issues would mitigate the requirement for face coverings, but clearly if the government guidelines require that, then we will clearly absolutely conform with those. Um, the other thing is clearly uh, we're very, very dependent, a large rural county like Shropshire on the home to school transport provision. We transport significant numbers of pupils. So in order to protect that network, we've been following the, um, the procurement uh, policy notes in terms of um, ensuring the network is there when we all hopefully emerge from this uh, pandemic and uh, whether it's eased out or we move out quickly. So we have been supporting that community of operators through uh, the supplier relief arrangements. So again, they run until the end of June, but overnight I've just noted that um, there is another public uh, a procurement notice uh, which is extending that guidance through to October. So we need to digest and understand the impact of that uh, to see how that plans uh, and uh, goes against the current guidance, which we will need to refresh on the basis of that. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. Uh, 
Okay, and a, another key aspect of, um, of, of school sport is, is around the, the finances. Um, schools have been um, right from the very start, uh, uh, start of this, uh, this pandemic and the crisis is uh, schools were guaranteed from the very get go that they were going, they were going their funding was going to be protected. So we're talking about their core funding through dedicated schools grant is protected for uh, the next year. So for maintained schools, that's from April through to next March. For academies, that's through to the end of August 2021. So that gives them reassurance. The primary purpose for that is to ensure the schools can continue to pay their staff and meet any other regular financial commitments. An important and key decision made very early in the um, in the in the pandemic. Um, but there has been recognition that uh, over and above that, there are additional costs coming through for schools that, uh, that are directly related to COVID. So government guidance issued in April, uh, beginning of April, um, made clear that there were uh, a range of costs that the schools could uh, collect details on and that they'd be able to reclaim those costs. And the government set up a, a banding arrangement where depending on the size of the school, you got uh, a limit on the amount of funds you could complain, you could claim for so some of these additional costs. So the, it ranges from 25,000 for schools up to 250 pupils. But as the banding go increases, any schools over 1,000 pupils can claim up to £75,000 for direct costs associated with COVID. Now they were an initial of their premises related costs uh, so with keeping schools open during holiday periods, support for free school meals, but also additional cleaning costs where they were confirmed as suspected COVID-19 cases. Now, clearly as time's moved on since April, and certainly with uh, officers working with schools and our schools community, it's becoming evident there are other costs in associating that perhaps are not being reflected in the current guidance. We are due guidance very shortly in terms of how schools claim that, but we are hopefully expecting that guidance to extend into other areas that emerge as we've gone through this journey in other areas where costs are uh, arising in schools that we would uh, argue, and certainly officers have been talking to the DFE through our dial-ins, so that uh, there are other costs emerging and schools are advising us that we need some recognition of the impact that's having on school budgets. So we talk about PPE, but also supply costs, uh, where clearly schools are reopening, but there, are, there may be vulnerable teachers, etc. So there are some costs emerging that perhaps weren't reflected in the original guidance, but we're pressing for them to be taken account of in the uh, guidance due to follow. One of the key issues, though, that clearly the guidance didn't cover, but has emerged as an issue is around private income. So that's income over and above the public money they get through the grant, the DSG. This is other income where so it's for paid school meals, uh, before and after school clubs, where they're getting income in and they're paying staff through that. That, that income is all, to all intents and purposes, dried up. And so the, gov the schools have no, no means to, to cover those costs. So again, we're pressing for guidance on that. Uh, at the moment, um, there's a minority of schools are potentially facing financial difficulties around that, but we're clearly and carefully monitoring those. But one of the routes through for schools was really to look at the, um, uh, the, the CJRS, the uh, Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme, uh, more commonly known as furloughing. So again, as the employer for maintained schools, uh, schools who were in those situations were invited to uh, submit uh, claims uh, for um, furloughing staff. Now this, got to be careful in terms, of, this is for staff who were furloughed who but are directly funded through private income. So it's a correlation between private income and furloughing staff. So uh, that invitation went out to all of our schools and then we got uh, responses from nine maintained schools uh, regarding their claims and they're looking to furlough up to 31 uh, employees. So that's, uh, that is currently being processed at this moment in time. And for talking to schools about finances is the schools uh, forum. And so we have a meeting on the 25th of June, a similar meeting to the construct of this one, uh, which we will be reporting on the impact of COVID-19 on school finances. And that'll be going in, in report form to schools forum. So thank you. And I'll next slide, please. And I think I'm handing back to Karen. Yes, Phil, thank you. You are. And just a, a point on the previous point that you've noted in terms of furlough and our schools. Of course, we're only talking about those schools that are maintained schools where Shropshire Council is the employer. Um, any academies, those uh, who may want to furlough, those are decisions that they as an employer need to make and are outside of Shropshire Council's um, control. 
Um, as I said earlier, um, the response to schools and supporting uh, schools and children and families has been a whole children and young people's directorate approach. So this next block of slides is around uh, particular services um, and around particular cohorts of children. Um, so first to early help. Um, so our early help services is, is exactly that. It's a provision that um, aims to um, address need at the earliest opportunity uh, for children and their families. Um, and so our early help service has stepped in to provide services where perhaps um, other services has, have stepped away through this COVID period. Um, and we've seen an uptake in their work in terms of uh, families, particularly at the tier two level. And what we're talking about there is um, a multi-agency approach where support is required from a multi-agency, uh, perhaps a provider base, um, but but at, at a low level, this is not very it's not highly intensive work that fits into um, the social care space. Um, so we've seen the early help teams working with uh, 48 families who fit into that category over the past uh, 10 weeks or so. Um, and um, importantly, we've used the family support workers. And the family support workers are, are allocated to either individual schools or groups of schools um, and they've worked with an additional 134 families um, from what we determined to be the vulnerable list and um, if any of you have looked at the definition of vulnerabilities that the government put out that is actually quite a, a wide base so um, this can apply to quite a, a wide range of young people um, and children so next slide please So the next slide um, relates to um, children uh, with uh, special educational needs and disabilities. Um, and we could have probably done a whole presentation on children with special educational needs, to be fair. Um, but I think it, it would be uh, pertinent to acknowledge that whilst I think um, children being at home over this period has been challenging for all children and all families, um, uh, we do acknowledge that it's been particularly difficult for, for children and families of children with special educational needs. Um, we have tried to continue our work as far as possible, but of course, um, children not being in school um, and not uh, staff not having the same capacity to work face to face, of course, does have its limitations. Um, but we have continued with our assessment process. Um, and, and as you can see there, what we have seen is an increased number of assessments or requests for assessments coming through during this period. Um, we don't quite know yet. We're still trying to work out whether that is because uh, that, that's about uh, the national, the, the natural increase rather in assessments, which we've seen increasing over over the years, or whether this has uh, come through at this particular time. Um, now, whether that schools having the capacity to complete those assessments and bring them forward, or whether there's an increased need. I think there's some work there for us to to unpack. Um, what is of course of concern is that because of some of the face to face interventions have not been able to take place. Um, we haven't undertaken any of the multidisciplinary assessments that we would normally take place, um, predominantly led by our health colleagues, um, but those are for our naught to five year olds. Um, so we're particularly anxious that um, we do need to put something uh, different in place around that. And we're currently working with our health professional colleagues um, to, to look at alternative methods of assessment. Um, it's also worthy of note that um, uh, Ofsted um, have also been keen to support local authorities um, in their work during this period. Uh, I mean, we have had an, uh, an Ofsted uh, inspector, HMI, assigned to, to us, um, and she is contacting all of the children um, with an HCP, uh, in priority those children who are due to go back um, to school. Um, and the transition of children um, uh, in year six. Um, and she's been sort of working through and raising any issues and we've been addressing those issues as we go along. Um, but I think it would be fair to say that the issues have not perhaps been as, as great as we might have anticipated. Um, so I think that's probably all that I would want to say on SEND um, at this point in time. Um, moving on then, please. Very briefly. And we do have uh, an education access service. So this deals with predominantly with children who are not in school. 
um, and who we want and need to get back into school. That's a, a regular service that we have wanted, of course, to use and build on their expertise around getting those children who need to be in school in school during this period of time. Um, and so through the connections between early help that I mentioned earlier, alongside the education access team, um, they've also been working with additional families to try to get more children, those children who fit into that vulnerable group um, uh, in school uh, as much as possible. Um, so I won't really read everything on that that slide, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, we have provided uh, quite additional um, information and policy guidance in terms of safeguarding children. Uh, and what's worked really, really well, actually, is um, the school um, virtual drop in sessions um, for designated leads in schools. And that's been worked really well. And I think we've had some really positive um, feedback about that. Moving on then, please. So um, the next slide um, work talks about children with a social worker. Again, we could have done a very comprehensive uh, uh, piece on this, um, but children with a social worker clearly fall into that, um, uh, uh, that vulnerable group. Um, and we've been very keen to get um, as many children who are looked after uh, into school as possible um, where it's appropriate to do so. And so we did do our risk assessment with all of those children to determine which ones uh, would be better placed in school um, and which ones would be better placed um, in their in their care environment, whether that's with foster families or whether it's in the residential setting. Um, I might add that many children have been thriving whilst they um, have been um, cared for um, wholly in their, uh, their, their accommodation setting, whether it is foster families or residential. Um, where necessary, we have met with children um, and um, I've had various examples of social workers who have gone out to meet children face to face, obviously in a social distance way, to persuade them to get back into school and, and can cite many successful uh, examples of that. So that's that's where social workers are trusted individuals um, uh, of, of, of these children and can persuade them in, in ways that, that others um, can't. We've clearly supported our foster carers. Our foster carers are always a really important group of people. Um, and so we've worked with them to um, enable them to undertake creative activities. And again, we acknowledge it's been a huge pressure on our foster carers who've um, kept children um, uh, or had to keep children at home. Um, again, moving on, please. Um, not necessarily about children in school, but I thought this uh, the next uh, slide was was interesting because, of course, schools do play a, a critical role in keeping children safe. So they are the ones that you have children um, in school day in, day out. Uh, and, and you know, we, we call it eyes on the child. So they're the ones that see children and can flag up to us um, any uh, sources or, 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 or issues of concern. And I think it would be fair to say um, that referrals into Compass, and that's what's our front door, that's where our referrals come in, about um, uh, children. Um, our referrals have reduced significantly. Shropshire's not alone in this. This is reflected in all local authority areas. Because of school, of course, as, as Steve's articulated, we haven't got the same volumes of children in school. So staff are just not able to make those referrals. Um, and as you can see, those referrals have dropped quite significantly from, you know, 54. So regularly we get 50 ish per month down to six in April. Um, and that clearly, we'll come back to that later in the presentation, um, but that clearly does flag up some concerns uh, for the future. Um, and as children go back into in school, more children go back into school, we're obviously concerned about um, what might, um, might happen as a result of that. Um, but we will come back to that later in the presentation. Um, so now I'm going to hand back to um, Steve Compton, our Principal Education Advisor, who's going to focus again initially on a specific group of children, and that's our looked after children. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Um, uh, so yes, just to um, delve down a little deeper into looked after children and the work of the virtual school. Um, as Karen's already alluded to, you know, we, we've worked uh, to make sure 
that virtual sorry uh, that looked after children have been in school um, as soon as possible partly to ensure that there's no breakdown of placements at home um, so virtual school have been working hard and keeping in contact with with schools um, one of the things which uh, Rose Super the head of the virtual school did um, in the early days of the pandemic before we knew that the central government were going to provide some laptops for children with a social worker, uh, Rose procured some laptops to ensure that those children who were at home were able to uh, learn remotely and access the curriculum. Um, as you read through the, the bullet points, you'll notice, uh, as Cameron's already alluded to, that um, lots of looked after children have thrived in what for many has been a more protective learning environment with fewer, fewer children in school uh, and so it's provided a, a valuable opportunity for those children to uh, really consolidate their learning in school. If we move to the next slide we'll see the, uh, the attendance figures for looked after children. So again this um, reflects the pattern between uh, straight after Easter and um, up until the Whitson half term, the May half term, and we can see that the blue bars on there are the, the total number of looked after children attending school. And you can see that the, the looked after children cohort um, quickly increased their time in attendance at school early in that half term. We can see that numbers rose very quickly towards the, the end of April and the end of May. Um, and the staff who work in the, the virtual school worked hard to uh, ensure what was the correct decision for those children and to get as many of them back into school as possible. Next slide, please, Tim. One of the challenges which schools have faced is the provision of home learning. Now, what we have on this slide is the, the DFE expectations. So these four bullet points are taken directly out of DFE guidance. Um, uh, and we can see that there's lots of flexibility uh, and much of this is open to interpretation. And in many ways, uh, lots of the decision making is localised decision making. One of the things which um, we've raised with the DfE, as we mentioned earlier, we have uh, meetings with the DfE and the Regional Schools Commissioner twice a week. Um, we've raised the need for more clarity over home learning, particularly um, not so much as we go through the rest of this half term, but as we move to September, if we still have children who do not all return to school at the start of September, we need clarity over what are the government expectations for home learning. And so we've raised that with, with the DfE and hopefully we'll have uh, more information coming back. One of the issues around home learning is that uh, it becomes more complex as we have more children now returning to school. Now that we have uh, in primary schools reception, year one, year six, children of uh, critical workers and vulnerable learners in school, if we think about what will be happening in schools, we have smaller bubbles of children, maybe classes of eight or nine children. Um, and so staff in school are providing full time teaching in school, but still we have to juggle and balance that with the provision of home learning. And that becomes more and more challenging. If we move to the next slide, please, Tim. We can start to unpick what we have uh, worked with schools on. Now, we mentioned earlier the importance of communication uh, and we've clarified the, the roots of communication, whether they be through uh, daily emails to head teachers, whether they be through um, head teacher briefings, whether it's through our uh, central policy group, etc. Um, we have ensured that communication uh, also clarifies the expectations uh, to schools in terms of what should be offered. We will often talk about a blended curriculum offer uh, and by blended we're really there talking about um, 
a, a, a mixture of different provision types within school. Now, one of the things which um, we know people want to see more of in times like this is the provision of online learning. Um, the Shropshire Council IT services have provided free training on Microsoft Teams and on a, um, a, an app and a programme called Seesaw, a learning platform called Seesaw, which is used in primary schools. And 80 schools have so far taken up that offer. Uh, now we have 127 primary schools, so 80 have taken up that offer. Um, and we have to remember that not all of our primary schools use Shropshire IT, so other schools will have sourced their um, CPD on online learning from other sources. Um, coming out of the DfE, there's been guidance and provision of resources through something called the Oak National Academy. Uh, so there was a, an initiative where a portal was set up that would contain curriculum materials, but also things like online assemblies, etc. That, um, that schools can use. To supplement that, the local authority have also pulled together a list of learning resources which can be accessed by schools. Um, and the music service and the library service have also uh, been very active in trying to uh, push for their curriculum offers to schools as well. Uh, schools um, have been expected to make regular contact with vulnerable pupils uh, and likewise from a, um, a, a social care perspective, children with social workers would have had that, that regular contact as well with their social workers. Um, we mentioned earlier the importance of our, our helpline uh, and we have had some parental concerns come back into the local authority uh, via the helplines and when they've, they've come back to us we have uh, pursued those and, and followed those up with schools. Um, nationally now this talk of what we're terming a recovery curriculum because one of the issues that we face is um, lots of young people have coped remarkably well with COVID-19 and the pandemic but equally there'll be a number of children who will be out of routine um, who will need some additional support in getting back into full time learning and establishing those school routines. So we'll work with schools to identify uh, the tasks that can be undertaken on a school based level to ensure that we have a recovery curriculum in place to support all of our young people in school. Next slide, please, Tim. We know we're not out of the woods, we know there's a long way to go uh, and equally we know that the, um, the pandemic situation will have quite long term impacts in terms of education. You'll have uh, you know, noticed in the news over the last couple of days that, um, that there's discussion about the impact on GCSEs and A levels in uh, 2021 and whether they should go ahead at the, the normal time or not. So we know we're in it for the, the long haul. When the pandemic first took effect, um, we would talk about childcare provision in schools, and that was the role of schools in the early days. It was to ensure that there was um, provision for vulnerable learners and key workers. Now we're entering into a phase where we're talking much more about uh, re-establishing formal education. That formal education might be in school or it might be um, at home. Uh, and that's one of the things we're, we're working with all providers on is shifting our focus now from that childcare provision back to education. Uh, we spoke already about the need for a curriculum that, that focuses on recovery, that establishes routines. Um, we know that one of the, the critical things that would normally happen at this time of year will be transition. Uh, and that's transition in three ways. That's children coming into reception that's children moving from year six into year seven and starting secondary school. And equally, it's children moving on to uh, post 16. So we know there's lots of work to be done still around transition. Karen mentioned the, the drop in early help referrals earlier. Um, uh, and one of the things which we, we need to prepare for is as we see the wider reopening of schools, making sure 
the local authorities ready to respond to probably an increase in referrals as children return to school and talk about their, their experiences. We know that, um, and we mentioned a, a phase reintegration earlier of schools. We know that across Shropshire, many of our school buildings are, particularly at primary level, are small Victorian buildings. And the buildings themselves bring limitations. Um, so we know for us to reach a point where we have all of our children returning to school, we need to overcome some limitations of those buildings. The numbers who can currently attend in reception year one and year six uh, are limited uh, as we try and implement social distancing. We know that's going to be a challenge moving forward. And coupled with that, you know, Phil spoke about transport earlier. Um, if we are looking to have all of our children back in school in the autumn term, we know that um, the transport system will be under increased pressure as to how we manage to get all of our children transported to school. Next slide, please, Tim. We've already mentioned about the, the difficulty uh, that, that some children have faced. It will bring increased anxiety to some children. We probably will see an increase in school phobia. Um, and we need to balance those with encouraging children to return to school. Returning to school for some children will be very difficult. We've already spoke about the need for readjustment, self-regulation, etc. Uh, and we need to work with schools to make sure that we're not seeing exclusions increase due to some of the issues around self-regulation and behaviour. Um, Karen mentioned earlier tier two work, and as we see more pupils return to school, we need to make sure schools have that capacity to work in that multi-agency approach to undertake tier two work. Uh, and the, the other thing which we've touched on several times is that the, the local authority is the, um, the organisation that arranges for the laptops which are provided by central government for children in care or children with a social worker. So one of the, the logistical things we are currently working through and Phil's been working hard on this is making sure that those laptops are provided to the children who need them most uh, and prioritising those laptops. Um, I think we've had a delivery of some of those laptops uh, and that work now is underway. Um, I'll hand back to Karen to see if Karen's got any closing comments. Thank you, Phil. And um, Chair, I, I appreciate that was a fairly lengthy presentation, um, but I do hope that it's given members a reasonably comprehensive overview of what's been happening um, and uh, and how schools and children and the local authority have responded um, to the um, uh, crisis that we found ourselves in. Um, I would just like to close by saying um, a big thank you, actually, um, and, and, uh, and appreciation to all of the hard work of our school staff, our teachers, our head teachers. Um, this has not been an ideal world for, for any of us, uh, and them in particular to operate in over the past 12 weeks. Um, it's been uncharted waters um, and we've had to respond, they've had to respond very quickly. Um, it's been difficult for families also, we know that, and for children. Um, so we just want to um, acknowledge our appreciation to all of those, but particularly our, our school staff at, at, uh, at this point. So Chair, over to you, um, back for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation. OK, so I've got a list of speakers here. Uh, I've got Joyce Barrow first. Would you like to ask your questions, Joyce? Yes, please. Um, that was so comprehensive. I think my first three questions have probably been answered. Uh, it was regarding furloughed staff, financial difficulties due to loss of income for schools and the risk, of, uh, risk assessment for schools remaining outstanding. Um, I believe you said there weren't any, so that's excellent. Um, what I'd like to know is how will the council find extra transport capacity due to social distancing and what measures are in place to fill gaps in school transport resulting from transport companies either in furlough or closing down? Do you expect Shropshire schools to return to normal in September? And what are the challenges for Shropshire schools between now and September and post-September? 
uh, how will schools address the gaps in education, given that we know some parents will be able to do more with their children at home than others? Um, I'd like to give a little snapshot. Um, I think sometimes when you personalise these things, uh, it adds a little bit more colour. My grandson is coming up to three and he's at WEM reception class. He goes two and a half days a week. He's gone back. Normally they have 30 children in that class, but only seven have gone back. They have one teacher two assistant teachers, which is really good for the teacher who's enjoying it, and also for the children, they're getting more attention. What are we doing to encourage, if we are, other parents to send their children back? And what are we doing for parents whose children are, shield, uh, are either shielded or the parents are shielded, which makes it impossible for the children to go to school? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, Karen, I think you and Phil are going to answer these questions, are you? Do you want to divvy them up? Um, well, I think I'm going to ask Steve to pick up um, the first element, please. I, right, I got okay. booted out, so I missed the first bit of the question. And there was a few in there, I think, wasn't there, Joyce? <laughs> there were, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, can um, I'll, I'll you. I can repeat them if, I, if you like. I think I'll, Steve I'll, pick up the first I'll one. Pick some of the latter ones, I think some of the early ones were around transport, which feels probably uh, best place to pick up. Um, you, you mentioned Joyce around uh, some of the challenges and uh, how schools return to normal and also what we're doing with parents. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment and, and we'll continue to see this as a significant challenge is how schools are managing to accommodate all of the requests for places uh, which uh, they're being asked for. Schools um, are setting up what's been affectionately known as bubbles. So by bubbles, we're having um, probably somewhere between eight to 12 children in a group and they stay in that group all of the time. Uh, and we try to avoid any mixing of groups or adding children in or taking children out because that increases uh, any, any contamination risks effectively. Um, Obviously, next week on the 15th of June, we're seeing a, a number of shops and um, you now we're seeing, I think, safari parks and zoos reopening and we'll continue to see more and more businesses reopening. Um, and effectively, that increases the number of critical workers um, who will be asking for school places. So I think in the short term, the biggest challenge for schools is how they manage to accommodate reception, year one and year six alongside an increase in key workers uh, and their children. Um, in terms of parents, one of the things we, we have done, uh, we've already mentioned the fact that we've set up the, the helpline for parents. Um, alongside that, we have prepared a, a set of FAQs for parents uh, and we're trying to communicate through various channels such as Twitter to try and get the messages out there. That the feedback from parents following children attending last week has been very, very positive. Uh, and likewise with children, children are happy to be back in school. Uh, and the, the anecdotal evidence we're hearing from parents is, is that they were apprehensive about children going back to school, but their children have loved being back in school and the parents are, 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 are very pleased with what schools have provided. Um, I'll hand over to Phil at that point to talk about some of the transport issues. OK, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Phil Wilson. Um, Joyce, I think you intimated that you'd that we'd covered in the presentation your original questions, but if I just home in on transport, well, clearly that is a, a key key issue for us. And uh, certainly um, Steve and I in our twice weekly conversations with uh, the Regional Schools Commissioner's Office and the DfE is, is to make that plea as, as the information and the plan, if you will, for September is critical. The lead in time for this cannot be understated. Uh, we need plan time to do this. Um, so clearly um, the, the uh, passenger transport group are clearly working with their providers. So the, through the sh supplier relief, we've kept them going, which is critical. So at least we're not doing it from a position of having to get people back into the game, if you will, who have struggled to keep their organisations going. So that's been a, a boon to us and that will be helping that stepping up that we'll require. Um, we will and they are engaging with those providers in terms of what additional transport they 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 are able to do. The alternative, as I've intimated, is 
uh, we may be able to fulfill that with the existing fleet, but it, that might be that might be two drop offs a day and two pickups a day in schools. So there's a whole raft of 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 uh, ways we can approach this issue, but it will be predicated on terms of what the plans are and almost in the context of the school buildings, which we've talked about, as well as the transport, th there's got to be some sort of movement on the um, the social distancing because that is a major, major barrier to to really opening this up. So in response, I think there's a vast array of strategies, but at the end of the day, if the tra transport is not available or the providers haven't got that, um, then we will really need to look at about the, 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 the aspirations, if you will, in terms of opening mightn't be as realistic and might need to be managed over a longer period than perhaps uh, the beginning of September. But we will do everything we can within our powers, working with all the, the operators, the schools and the providers to, to, to achieve the very, very best we can. But in some instances, we might be talking about school rotors, we might be talking about not, not all the year groups coming back. We will have to play it by ear and it may be on a case by case basis. It may be down to the very local level in terms of what can be achieved in that local area. But there's a vast array of strategies that we can employ. Uh, but we do need some some further steers in terms of how it's going to operate and certainly around some of the um, the current uh, restrictions that uh, compromise our ability to do anything effectively. But again, a concern would be that um, there may be some costs coming with this as well. There might be some additional costs, so we need to be realistic. But a whole raft of, uh, raft of strategies and approaches we can take and we will employ all of them. OK, uh, Joyce, you wanted to come back briefly. Um, yeah, very brief. I will be brief. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards myself and many other members, I have two primary schools. I'm in a rural area, which is Morder Primary School and also uh, Trevonin Primary School. They obviously have issues with buildings um, and it would be impossible if, if social distancing came in to have all those children in those schools. I'd be extremely grateful if members could be kept up to date on exactly what is happening to make it possible for all those children to return in September, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Joyce. Um, so I've got Roger. Would you like to ask your questions now, Roger? Thank you, Chairman. Um, they're basically around this slide, and I'm talking really about uh, some of the information early on. Uh, there may be others that want to ask about the individual curriculums and everything like this. So <clears throat> if we look at slide four, it says their attendance on the 5th of June, 18.9% of schools have introduced rotors. So that, does that mean that the schools, I assume, due to capacity or ability of uh, availability of teachers, uh, one in five schools are unable at the present to admit uh, all the pupils that could be there as shown by the government. Where do we expect that to be uh, come June the 22nd when you're saying that we'll be increasing the number of schools opening? Where might we be then? How many of those would, in, would need to uh, have capacity? And notice about face coverings and if it is introduced next week, how are we going to maintain that the children, when they go onto the buses, maintain the, uh, the face coverings that is there? I pick up about the transport and the uh, reduced ability. What are we doing about siblings? Will they be sitting together? Because as I understand it in schools, siblings are not allowed to be, be part of the same uh, bubbles. They are separate and I'm interested in how we will may be maintained in the bubble separation in those. And then um, two more. One is to do with furloughing of staff and council budgets. I see on um, slide nine the reference about uh, private income uh, presenting a minority of schools with potential financial difficulties. I'm not sure what's happening about kitchen staff. I see there's 31 employees. I think some of them may now be kitchen staff. And how were they to be funded in the future? A number of schools I would expect are including income for meals in their budgets for this year. If we go all of summer term by the look of it, their income for meals will be way down 
but the kitchen staff will still be on the school's books as having to be paid for. Um, why was the delay in furlough in the staff until um, a couple of weeks ago, I think? And I understand a number of schools have said, being told they can only furlough staff <clears throat> until later in June. Why is that when the furloughing scheme will go further into the school holidays? And then finally, Chairman, is the uh, number of children who have been referred to the local authority. Nationally, they're saying that the number of children being referred to the local authorities is increasing because of the problems incurred in the schools having to be closed. Have we shown any indication of that? Thank you, Chairman. OK, thank you very much, Roger. Would you like to mute the mic so that we can hear? That's it. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Karen, um, that's you and Steve, I presume. Do you want um, to? Well, I'm going to ask Steve probably to talk about the rotors and yeah. then, um, and then uh, the transport stuff and the uh, furloughing of staff and turn to Phil and then I might come in with the furloughing staff as well. OK, fine. Should we start off with Steve then? Yeah. Um, the voters were determined by risk assessments uh, and in part when schools carried out their risk assessments, they were basing it on uh, feedback from parents as to how many children might return. Um, I think one of the things which we did see was the number of children who attended school on June the 1st was probably slightly lower than schools anticipated. Um, and I think that's probably lower because it, it followed the weekend where there was lots of um, new stories about the safety of schools and the reports coming out of some of the sage scientists. Uh, and likewise, we just had a, um, a, a weekend of very hot weather. Uh, and I think that probably um, affected some parents' decisions as well. Um, we do have a number of schools that use rotors uh, and we were very clear when we agreed our, our ways of working, our principles with schools to say that it would be uh, a school based decision for schools to determine what works for them. Um, I had a, a conversation this morning with an infant school. So within Shropshire, we, we still have a number of infant schools. Um, so an infant school would have reception year one and year two. So effectively three year groups. Uh, and the government is asking for two of those three year groups to um, to attend. Uh, so you can imagine the, the the pressure on numbers within infant schools, um, even if all of their children did turn up in reception year one, plus key worker children, plus uh, vulnerable children in year two. Um, I, I think effectively you need to double the size of the school and go a bit further before you could uh, manage to, to meet the need. So yes, we do have some schools that do have those. Um, will we expect it to, to fall? Yes, I think we probably will expect it to fall. Uh, and part of this um, is affected, as you alluded to, Roger, by staffing. Uh, there'll be some staff who have yet to return to work. Partly some of those staff will be shielding. Some of them may have COVID symptoms. Uh, some of them may have um, not been in work because they're, they're self-isolating. Uh, as we see more staff return to work, we'll probably see uh, a reduction in rotors, but equally that has to be balanced by an increase in numbers returning as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, probably fair to say it will be at least the start of the autumn term until we're back to a level of normality. Uh, we're probably all very well aware that um, Gavin Williamson, uh, Education Minister, announced yesterday that the government's ambition to have uh, years two, three, four and five returning to school, um, that has now been um, postponed because it, it simply isn't possible with the, the level of social distancing that is required um, and the, the resources available to schools, both physical resources in terms of um, classrooms, but also staff and resources as well. Uh, and if I picked up on the bubbles um, uh, and siblings being together or not, um, it's up to schools to, to decide their own bubbles. 
Um, siblings could be in the same bubble if, if the school wanted to do it, and it might depend on whether those siblings were uh, in school because they were in reception year one or year six, or whether they were in school because they were children of key workers or had an EHCP. Um, I had a conversation with one school earlier in the week around siblings sitting together in school, uh, and I said it would be my view that siblings could sit next to each other. You probably um, wouldn't want to uh, distance them by two metres, but we have to be careful about how those children are role modelling to others. Um, so I, I think siblings is a very difficult one to, to answer and again it'd be a school based decision. Um, I'll hand over to Phil to pick up some of the, the items around furloughing and finances. OK, thank you, Steve. Phil Wilson. Um, just in terms of the face coverings, uh, the face coverings uh, is uh, only at this moment in time is is uh, related to transport. It's not a requirement in, in the school setting. Um, so again, this was a comment made by the Secretary of State in Parliament yesterday. Uh, the guidance doesn't currently say that. So clearly we will follow government guidance on everything that we're doing, and that's clearly council policy. So while that's been said in passing it uh, in response to a question in Parliament, that needs to, to come through in the guidance. So we will monitor that closely. And clearly, if that's a requirement uh, that we update our guidance, our transport guidance on that, then clearly we will do that in line with government guidelines. Um, if I could just talk about catering and, and schools in particular, um, hopefully I talked uh, in terms of furloughing, uh, hopefully uh, 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 committee members are clear in terms of the furloughing relates to private income. So around catering, there is still income coming in that's not paid for meals. So again, if you think about the groups that are coming back into school, which are reception and key stage one, or sorry, uh, year one, actually we are statutorily required to provide those children with meals. And so we're seeing an increase in the actual provision of catering in schools for those particular groups coming in, which is our statutory requirement. So all those children are uh, uh, eligible for a free school meal. So what we will see is staff might have been short term furloughed, um, but clearly as schools begin to open and uh, we get more children in, then actually there's a need to get some of those catering staff back in school and supporting that school. So it's a combination of linking uh, furloughing to loss of private income, but if they're going to start to get the government grants and they still have been getting the government grant for uh, uh, key stage one free school meals. Uh, so th that they'll it'll change by school by school, but clearly there is a scaling up of the catering staff required on that. Um, in terms of furloughing, um, I perhaps I need to hand over to Karen in terms of the timescales for that, but that furlough submission has, has, has gone in, the application has gone in, but I, I, I'll ask, hand over to Karen in terms of the timing of that, uh, that claim and why it wasn't done perhaps earlier. Karen. OK, can thank just, you. Um, sorry, can I just, um, we have got a lot of people who want to ask questions, so if we can try and be a little bit succinct with the answers. Um, Roger's asking to come back. I did notice nobody answered his last question. I think that's the number of children referred to the local authority. So if you can pick that up, Karen. Yes, Chair, I'll pick that up. Just in terms of the furloughing, very, very briefly, um, the initial guidance that we were getting from the government was that um, clearly um, the public sector could not furlough their staff. And there was a pushback from some schools around the private income, as Phil has articulated. Um, and then, of course, um, as a, the employer, we can only make one application for furlough. Um, so we had to gather all of that information from all of the schools to determine um, which schools wanted to put that application forward. I think it's quite indicative that out of all of the maintained schools, only nine schools have come forward with a, a furlough request, um, which, as uh, Phil said, that's now gone in. Um, in respect to referrals, I can confirm that the referrals, um, and, and I did mention it in the presentation, um, in terms of referrals into children's social care have fallen, and that is in line with all other local authority areas. We're not an outlier, we're not different. Um, every local authority is seeing that because exactly the reason I explained, it's about um, the, the, the referrals coming in from the schools um, and, and other partners actually. Um, but what we are seeing is where referrals are coming in, they are of a more complex nature. Um, so it, it, it is of concern. We're absolutely there, but we are not um, out of kilter with um, the rest of the country. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen. Roger, do you want to just come back briefly, you said? Thank you, Chair. 
Yes, please. And it's about budgets and costing because I don't want schools to have to face into September and the new academic year uh, extra costs and having to uh, find some ways to defray the costs that, that they've incurred this term. And especially if we look at catering costs, because March the 23rd was when schools closed. The catering departments there were fully employed doing it, but schools were only looking at certain categories of, ch of children. All those costs have been mounting up and mounting up. If one looks at the government paper that came out, it says that the £25,000, set fifty and £75,000, can only, only at present, be used for increased premises relating costs, support for free school meals, and additional cleaning cannot claim any other costs against this 25,000. Uh, and that's where some of the schools are finding difficulty. Another statement's coming out in June, but uh, how are schools going to manage the, with their budgets if the catering costs are still put against schools' budgets and they are supposed to be delivering at least a balanced budget or a surplus budget for this financial year and not a deficit one? Thank yeah, you. and I think thank you, Roger. And I think actually Phil mentioned that when he spoke. Uh, Roger, you, 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 you might, please. please. Thanks. That's it. I can hear now. Okay, so I think Phil mentioned that in his presentation um, that there is another meeting. Do you want to just come back briefly, Phil? Yes, I, I would say that. Um, yes, we'll clearly pick that up at schools forum. What I would say is that guidance is critical, as Roger intimates. So I think there'll be more latitude given in that guidance. The other thing I would say, the guidance does allow us uh, some in exceptional cases to go back to the department. So I think through our forums with the DFE, if we've got a school that's in a particular circumstance has been going into a deficit situation, then I think on behalf of that school, we would take that up with the department, look for some exceptional uh, support for those schools if those incidents arise. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Right, so I've got Hannah Fraser next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose by way of background, I've got um, a primary school age child and a secondary school age child, um, both at home at the moment. Um, and of course, lots of the people I know being of that sort of age bracket, uh, you know, lots of the people I know socially have got kids very much not in school at the moment, but school age kids. Um, and my sort of real interest in um, this topic for scrutiny uh, really came from speaking to, you know, lots of the people that I know and um, what seemed to be the very, very varied experience of different children um, in Shropshire, just depending what school they're at, as to um, what kind of um, educational interaction they're having at the moment with their school. Um, with that in mind, I did pop a quick survey onto Facebook and got about 700 odd responses in a couple of days. So it's obviously quite a, a, a topic for um, that is uh, um, a live topic for lots of parents. Um, my my and it was very and I've forwarded the um, the results of the survey, which I hope um, will be of interest and hopefully useful as well, just in terms of giving a window into sort of parents' view of, of how schools are operating at the moment. Um, personally, I'd like to extend my thanks to all schools at the moment. It's unprecedented circumstances. Um, there's um, you know we've moved now from a kind of ah response to oh my goodness schools are shutting. Whoever would have thought schools were shut, and, and now we're into a more measured um time frame so i was very interested to hear about your comments that you also recognize that it's a kind of a transition now into okay now here we're in a situation that's certainly going to last for the the next half term and for some kids homeschooling may last for perhaps another half term after that so um my concern really is um around moving forward um in terms of the variety of experience that um children are getting how can we make sure that most kids get the best experience they can and the best kind of access to education at the moment going forward. Um, in terms of responses to my survey, 76% of responses were for primary school age kids. And I think probably secondary school age kids by and large are more self-serving and the issues around um, helping them to access um, whatever the schools are laying on are, are perhaps a little bit more straightforward. But for primary school children, um, it's not necessarily so straightforward and the, the big 
take home message from from the results of the survey were that um, most parents seem to feel that the amount of work that the children are getting is probably broadly about right, but the amount of interaction with schools is not enough. Um, and so reading through the very detailed comments, the experiences of children seem to range from at one end, um, perhaps a school will be doing um, Zoom assemblies, they might be doing daily um, interaction with a teacher through an app, um, and there will be marked work or at least feedback on work on a daily or weekly basis. So that seems to be the sort of gold standard at the moment. Um, a, a lot of kids are getting less interaction than that. They're having um, a day, you know, perhaps a weekly worksheet from some teachers and then very little feedback. So they're being guided in terms of accessing materials, but there's no real educational interaction with the school. And then at the very far end of the spectrum, there seem to be some parents who can't interact with school at all or are chasing school for educational materials. So I'm really concerned that, and, and of course it's a um, such a sort of diverse patchwork at the moment of how schools, you know, whether academies, whether they maintain schools, whether they buy the services from Shropshire Council, all the rest of it, there's, you know, Shropshire Council doesn't necessarily have, um, there's no one size fits all sort of answer to this. But it does seem to me that um, some kids are not getting <clears throat> the kind of input um, from schools that other kids are getting. Um, so my questions then are really around how can Shropshire Council um, really promote what is best practice and kind of disseminating, especially going forward as there's more emphasis on curriculum and as you're talking about a sort of recovery curriculum and perhaps, you know, better engagement with kids. Um, how can that sort of good practice be disseminated? Um, is there guidance on um, what the expectations are for not just the curriculum, but for the kind of social support? I know kids would just love to see their classmates. You know, they'd love to have a Zoom meeting, meeting with their table of six kids or whatever. You know, could that be done once a week? And lots of parents are saying the same thing. You know, they, lots of parents are saying, you know, if they know kids at private school, they're all getting Teams meetings and they're having the curriculum just delivered as it was. It's just over a different platform. And, you know, parents are saying, why can't schools engage um, with kids and parents um, on these online platforms um, in the way that um, perhaps other, other schools are enabling? Or, you know, and then um, <laughs> rumours are bound that, that the unions are telling teachers that they shouldn't be interacting with um with kids over um, teams or all those sorts of things or that there are GDPR problems with using people's data in those ways so um, you know there's there's lots of rumours abounding as to as to why um, you know some of the technology that could presumably be used to great effect is not is not being used um, and then of course we come on to the issue which you touched on which is that the more children go into school it's actually less easy for schools to then interact with kids who are out of school um, through home learning platforms. So um, how can, because I think going forward, it will be the case for some time that most children will not be in school. So uh, for schools to be focusing 90% of their effort on the minority of kids who are in school seems, um, seems wrong, seems the wrong approach um, for our children in Shropshire. Um, so those are my questions, really. Sorry, sorry, Hannah. Yeah, I've, I've tried to, you know, I've tried to be patient, but you, you know, you, you've had about, I don't know, quite a long time okay. um, without so, asking the question. So okay. can you no, put I've, the I've, question? I've, yeah, yeah, I've asked for what are the plans for disseminating the good and best practice. Um, are there clear expectations for both curricula and kind of pastoral support? You know, do schools know what it is that they're supposed to be doing? Um, what about these rumours that there are restrictions on, um, you know, GDPR or, or you know, guidance for, for teachers that they shouldn't be perhaps using some technology to um, access pupils? Um, and how can we ensure that most children who continue to be at home will be supported as more children go back into schools? Thank you. OK, thank you, Steve. Would you like to um, yeah. answer uh, quite succinctly? Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of dissemination, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we continue to have things such as head teacher briefings. So, for example, tomorrow we have secondary head teacher briefings, and then next week we have primary head teacher briefings. So, we will continue to use those. 
plus our one to one conversations with head teachers to um, both support and challenge schools in terms of what they should offer. Uh, and aligned to that, uh, I, I think that um, we would recognise there is an inconsistency at times. Uh, and if we're made aware of those inconsistencies, we will follow those up and we'll challenge those. Um, in terms of the, uh, the pastoral prioritisation, um, yes, agree entirely, there is a, a real need to make sure we look after the, the, the mental well-being of children uh, and would continue to encourage schools to do that. In terms of GDPR, there are no GDPR concerns. Um, there is union advice around use of streaming lessons and contacting pupils uh, through Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Um, the advice will differ from primary schools to secondary schools uh, and we'd say things like um, streamed learning is more appropriate in secondary schools and primary schools. Um, and equally aligned to that, we have to be careful that we don't um, disenfranchise or increase the disadvantaged gap if we do too much that is online, we have to remember there will be a number of families who have no access to any online resources uh, and we don't want to increase that disadvantaged gap. Um, uh, and finally, I, I think the, the one around home learning um, will continue to be a challenge as we go forward. Uh, that's why we've raised the question with the DfE to ensure we get more guidance as to the expectations around uh, the home curriculum for those children who are not in school. OK, thank you very much. Are you content, Hannah? You need to unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for those answers. I'm, I'm worried by this business about disenfranchising, you know, the fact that you can um, Zoom to most kids or Teams to most kids, but not some disenfranchises those. You know, we've already seen that laptops are being given to black children and, and others. <coughs> I don't know a single family and I know quite a wide variety of families that don't have a phone um, and nobody's asking for primary schools <laughs> to be Zooming lessons for six hours a day to kids. You know, they're kind of saying, you know, a weekly meeting with their teacher with six of their, their, their peers to enable a bit of peer to peer support or twice a week or, you know, those sorts of things. So, you know, some of these arguments say, you know, it can't be done. Well, actually, it could be done a bit. You know, there could be a, a step forward in the right direction, which will only help kids to merge back into school when that finally happens. Yeah. OK, yeah. okay so thank you very thank you very much, Hannah. And I'm sure Steve will take that uh, take that on board. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. So I've got um, Peggy next. Peggy, would you like to unmute? There you go. Thank you, well Jack. done. Uh, Peggy Mollock, just three quick questions. Uh, you focus on schools, but do you have any date on early years provision? Will any schools be open during the summer holidays? And have all vulnerable attended schools? And if not, what have we done to support them, please? OK, thank you, Peggy. Um, Karen, can I ask you to answer those questions, please? You can chair. Yes, thank you. And um, yes, we obviously um, do have some information in terms of uh, early years um, and um, like schools, many of them um, in the early phases in March were closed. Some were open, obviously, to provide childcare for uh, key workers um, and vulnerable children. Um, and where nurseries were closed, we helped to uh, broker um, children going to other nurseries where childcare was needed. Um, the latest data that we have got that I can share with you, but I will need just to put my glasses on in order to read it, um, is that as uh, nurseries started to open more widely, again in line with the schools from the 1st of June, um, as of the 4th of June, which is the latest information I've got available to me at this time, um, there were 823 children in early years providers, of which 445 were key workers, 40 were vulnerable children and 338 um, others. So that's, a, that's um, a, quite a big increase um, from the previous week, so probably more than double. Um, so that's is that OK for the early years question? Yes, thank you. 
OK, um, in terms of the summer holidays, I think that's a really, really good question. Um, and um, I don't think that's one that we can necessarily answer at this point in time. And um, we are, of course, awaiting guidance from the um, from the department around um, their their views and direction on that. Um, I do think in fairness, um, probably schools do need a bit of a break. Many schools have been open um, for the duration. Um, um, so I, I really can't answer that one at this point in time, but we do await further information. And in terms of vulnerable children, I think we've uh, articulated through the presentation and um, the number of vulnerable children um, who have been in school. Um, I think that there would be a view that um, we would have liked more of those vulnerable children in school. And we've encouraged that where we can and I've explained uh, social work has been out to visit children. We've had staff contacting families directly and um, particularly some of our children with special educational needs and disabilities. We would have liked more of those children in schools and we've challenged directly uh, those schools to, to make that available. Um, but it's not it, you know, it's not a you know it probably isn't where we would want it to be really but um we've done um a, a, as much as we possibly can do to get to those children who need to be in school um uh, in school okay thank you um i just see um i've just been uh, sent a message via the chat and it just says that in the daily mirror and telegraph today it's reported about an increase in calls for at-risk children being received by the NSPCC. Would you like to just come back on that, please, Karen? Yeah, of course, Chair. Um, when I answered previously, I answered the question in response to referrals into the local authority, um, and um, I stand by that, uh, that picture, both in Shropshire and um, nationwide. Um, in terms of referrals into the NSPCC, um, of course, we need to be mindful that the NSPCC was promoted. There's been a national campaign um, where people have got concerns to phone or contact the NSPCC. Um, uh, in reality, all the NSPCC do is to pass those referrals on to the local authorities. Um, so um, if that's the case, and I haven't seen a report, so I can't comment, but clearly we'd be expecting those referrals to be passed on to the local authorities um, as a statutory body to deal with safeguarding referrals. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for coming back, Karen. I've got uh, Cecilia Motley next. Thank you, Chair. This is this is actually just a quick one, really, um, and it's a slight follow up from what um, Joyce uh, was talking about right at the beginning about the rural schools. Um, I, I know that it's very difficult for rural schools because a lot of them are small um, to, to cope with social distancing, but I'm just wondering whether we have a sense of how many uh, children in rural schools are actually not able to access um, remote learning, either because staff can't provide it for them because uh, to stretch with having to deal with the with the classes that are already in school or because they simply don't have either the broadband or the um, the, uh, the the equipment to do it because I am worried about the fact that when schools eventually manage to get back together again it's going to take an awful lot of work to bring all children up to speed with each other if some have been in school some haven't been in school and I'm just wondering what on earth we can do if either parents aren't uh, aren't um, encouraging children to uptake remote learning or uh, uh, remote learning can't be accessed anyway. Thank you. I think Chair, perhaps Steve could pick yep. that up in the first instance. Yeah, um, Steve, would you like to pick that up? Thank you. Um, we don't have any uh, data as such, Peggy, regarding the um, uh, see you rather regarding the um, the issues that you talk about. Uh, I, I think what we can probably uh, provide some some soft intelligence on, if you like, is, is the fact that this would be one of the reasons why some schools would introduce voters, so that if schools are finding the um, the size of their buildings an issue, they they could have different pupils in on different days. Um, also, in terms of some of the internet issues, alongside the laptops which are provided for vulnerable children, uh, there is also some small scale provision of internet dongles to get some more children online. Um, 
but I, I think we probably uh, agree entirely with the points you raise uh, and that would work with schools as much as possible to get as many children back into school as soon as possible. Thank you for that. Um, have you got anything else you'd like to ask Cecilia? No, no, uh, thanks. Quite a lot of it has already been covered. OK, so um, I've got two things here. Um, Ed Potter, the portfolio holder, would like to come in at the end. I just want to try and um, tidy up the loose ends here. Um, Hannah just mentioned she wanted to briefly mention um, a, a letter she had uh, about the censure and which was uh, sent out to us all. So can I ask um, Hannah to come back on that one? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I had a letter from PAC, which is the Parents and Carers uh committee um who are uh, concerned with um special educational needs children and disabled chair, uh, children um uh, supporting them and their parents they wrote to me specifically saying that their feedback from their parents is that quite a lot of their send children are not getting differentiated work in terms of home learning so they're finding it that they're struggling and um, that they're not um getting any form of one-to-one -one support through EHCP, um, which they're disappointed about. Um, and they also made some comments about um, whether or not Savendale is um, sort of using the right um, way of deciding whether or not children should be coming back into school, whether or not they're, they're vulnerable at Savendale. Um, and I think um, I did forward the, the letter, so hopefully um, Karen and her team will be able to look at that and take that on board. But I did just want to mention it here as well. Chair, perhaps if I could just come in, oh dear, yep. uh, come in there. Uh, um, am yep. I showing my window? Uh, I, I can see you and I can hear you. All right, sorry about that. Um, yes, thank you, Hannah. We have received the letter and um, we will be, uh, I mean, we were aware of some of the issues and obviously you do expect us to be aware um, and to be dealing with them. And um, so um, we will be picking up on the, all of those or following up on those things. Thank you. OK, and I've just got Rogers come back to me um, and perhaps you'd like to answer basically what Rogers saying or what you've said is that the NSPCC have been very proactive in asking people to call them if they're worried about children. Rogers come back and saying actually the NSPCC reports an increase of 32 percent um, is that what you'd expect, Karen, if you could just briefly answer that one? OK, so to confirm, the government undertook a promotion campaign promoting the NSPCC as the um, course for uh, individuals to report safeguarding matters to. Um, that's dis that was disappointing from a local authority perspective because, of, as I said, we're the statutory body that deals with those safeguarding referrals. So all it was doing was promoting a third party, really, rather than promoting your local authority uh, front door, uh, which is our compass. Um, so all I can say is that, um, you know, if NSPCC is sitting on 32% increase in referrals, they need to be passing them to us as a local authority. Um, and I'm not cited on any information that tells me that we're getting a lot of data or referrals through the NSPCC, but I can certainly go away and check that up. Uh, OK, thank you, Karen. If you could check that up and yeah, uh, we'll just email us. Yeah, no okay, worries. OK, so I think hopefully everyone's had a fair opportunity to ask questions. So what I'm going to do now is, Ed Potter, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Would you like to say a few words at the end? Well, yeah, I think um, obviously there's been a, a very detailed discussion there and um, uh, a very detailed uh, amount of information put forward by officers. I just wanted to add my thanks to the school community to for all that they have done in the last uh, few months. It's been a, a very challenging time, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, particularly want to thank um, uh, our parents and young people who uh, have done their best to adapt. One of the, the key things, I suppose, from my perspective as well, is the our thanks to foster carers uh, within Shropshire who have really um, stepped up to the mark, accommodated a, a additional children and worked very closely with some of our most vulnerable children in Shropshire to um, to look after look after them and ensure that they uh, have access to the to education, uh, whether it be homeschooling or or into school if they're in in the vulnerable um, category. 
Um, over recent weeks, um, we've seen how it's been a very emotive um, subject, the school's opening. Um, but I think one of the key messages as well, which sort of came out and has just been discussed just a moment ago, is that how important it is for professionals to have eyes on our young people, on our children. When we look at the number of referrals that would naturally come through from schools into our uh, compass, first point of contact to to, um, to protect you know, vulnerable uh, children, I think that's key that when more and more young children go back to school, that um, professionals will have eyes on them. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, Karen, would you like to say anything before we wind up? Would you like to? Yeah. Um, um, no, Chair, I think um, we've, as I say, we've done a comprehensive um, input um, and um, hopefully people have felt um, assured that um, the local authority and schools are responding as positively as they can to this very difficult environment that we find ourselves in that we've never experienced nor expected to experience um, six months ago. Um, and as we said, it is transitionary. Uh, you know, we're learning lots all the time and things are changing and developing um, every day and every week and um, as guidance comes along. So again, just my thanks to everybody concerned, um, uh, uh, my team particularly, schools, staff obviously, um, and not least of all parents who for many of them are, are teachers in their own right now. Thank you. OK, thank you. Hello, Hello. can I just say something? Yes, you can, yes. Um, just very quickly, I think Karen and her team have done an absolute outstanding job. Um, and I, I, I do, do a thanks, I think, from the council to, to that department. It, a, a wonderful job right through um, f from end to end of this crisis. And I think uh, our thanks should go, to Karen, to you, to you and your team. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, Les. Yes, what I was going to say was, I think we ought to note the report, but also send a thank you to all the staff, all the teachers, all the parents and the kids, because I think we have to stick at this and try and work together. Um, and, you know, as far I know, um, Hannah's done quite a bit of work sending surveys out, but we're all community leaders. You know, if there's little things we can do to help, then uh, let's do it. So let's note the report and send our thanks to all the staff for all the hard work they've uh, they've done. Is everyone Thank happy you. with that? Yep. Yeah. 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 OK, fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much indeed, Karen. Thank you. And Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Are you all right? Yep. Thank you, Doke. Right. So we now have um, item number seven, which is the quarter four corporate finance, corporate performance report. Um, Tom, can I ask you to uh, introduce the report and introduce yourself? Um, hi, uh, Tom Dodds. I'm the Intelligence and Insight Manager at the Council um, and performance, corporate performance sort of fits within that, that role. I'm not going to necessarily go through the report, um, but needless to say that quarter four was um, quite an extraordinary time for the Council <laughs> um, in the, in, you know, with the flooding and then the move into, into COVID-19. So um, I think with 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 some of the, the the data and the performance which has been reported it's clear to see the impact that we've um we've seen so um one of the good examples is the the theater and the old market hall which were looking um very positive um and likely to exceed uh, previous years income um but but this was obviously impacted through through the, the last quarter but um I'm happy to take take questions, but I know we've also got Andy and Karen um, on the call as well, so um, you know we, we we can draw on their experience too. Okay, thank you. So um, I've got a question here, Roger. You want to ask a question? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, it's good to be able to get into the report because when it went to cabinet, uh, I don't think anybody was actually able to get into the report due to a, a licensing issue, which has now been sorted out by IP, IT. So thank you for that. If we turn to um, section 10.3 and the local transport plan, LTP4 was supposed to be done last year. It's now running behind. And I know it may be looked at a task and finish group next week, 
but the blame is about climate emergency that Shropshire Council declared is holding it back because it needs to be incorporated. Is there anything that can be added to it as to what part is it? Why is it running this late? Uh, climate emergency is almost 12 months old now, um, but I'm surprised that it isn't yet ready for distribution because we need it there to actually claim money from government, I thought. I've got, an, I've got another one as well, if you want, Chairman, me to ask it now. Yes, go and ask your question, Roger. Right. Yeah. Homeless strategy was supposed to be there in December 19, before the flood and the C19, but I see it's going to Cabinet next week. Again, why was that there? Um, I see in the other data, it says that under schools, the number of children receiving free school transport, it says in the report, waiting for data from the appropriate department. Is it on its way? And lastly, laptops. I see there's a report about it. And I note that Shropshire is now receiving 400 laptops. I was in a meeting yesterday where they're saying there's difficulty obtaining laptops. Have we identified the schools and where they're actually going? Thank you. OK, um, I will pass over to Tom or Karen to answer those questions, Roger. But I do think, though, I mean, people... Roger, can you turn your mic off, please? OK, so, so I will pass over to Tom and Karen to answer your questions. But I, I do actually think that the people in transport, I really take my hat off to them because what they've had to do to try and organise getting these kids to school. So if they're a little bit late with a historic report, I have to say I'm not too bothered about that. But I'll pass over to uh, Tom first and he can direct the question, the answers. OK, I shall, uh, I shall do my best. Um, I think there's an, in terms of the local transport plan floor, we'd have to, you know, maybe pick that up through the task and finish group as Rogers, Rogers, Rogers um, suggested. Um, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, and as it's from within the, the, the particular service area, it's not one I'd want to sort of try and sort of table a response to. Um, homelessness strategy, I don't know if Andy's still still with us. Um, but again, that's that's it's a, I suppose I would say, a complex area, and things have changed quite, quite a lot through this. But again, it's not my, my, my lead area, so an explanation would have to be sought from, from the service area there. Unless I, mean, I don't think Dr. Karen will have a, um, a view in relation to that. I think um, laptops for, I'm guessing it's laptops for schools that you're referring to, or pupils, Roger. And Karen might want to pick up on, on that one. In terms of home to school transport, we can follow up with the. With the, with the service area again, but you know they, they will have been under a lot of pressure um, over the last last few um, months as well. Um, I know that doesn't give you satisfactory answers to your questions, but um, we can I can I can follow up. Okay, uh, so that. I've got uh, I've got two two people here on the side here. Daniel Webb wanted to re to respond to one of the questions, and Andy Begley wants to talk about homelessness. So if if you go on, you go first, David uh, Daniel, and then we'll go. OK, thank you very much, Claire. Um, I've seen there's now a brief out for the local transport plan, which has gone to WSP for costing and returning back to uh, the transport team, uh, which consists, from what I can see, of Victoria, Maryland and nobody else. So we just have the one officer. Um, the completion date for that is September 2021, which may seem a long way away now, but I suspect for a document of that complexity, particularly with the consultation involved, that strikes me as a thoroughly realistic timescale for producing a document of that size. Um, that it's certainly um, the intention of the Road Safety Task and Finish Group to look at the LTP insofar as it exists at the moment. Certainly we have LTP3. <coughs> which warrants scrutiny as, as that is our current local transport plan and certainly the nearest that we've got um, and I know from looking at the the brief that's been sent to WSP that it does include um, the, the instruction that it consider 
uh, the, the climate emergency that we've declared. So really at, at the moment we're at the stage where it's for us as officers and for you as members to uh, begin to influence that process and I can think of no better place for you as members as the Road Safety Task and Finish Group to start asking some of these questions, particularly as within the remit of the group, to, to look at the broader issues around transport other than um, sort of motor vehicles um, and killed and seriously injured statistics. Um, so I think really in, in that regard we just sit tight really to see um, when the first draft of that comes out or when they start consulting on some of the themes that they would like to include in that. Okay thank you Daniel. I'm going to hand over to Andy now to speak about homelessness and then back to Karen on the laptops. Thank you Claire, it's Andy Begley speaking again, I'll be very brief, but in terms of the uh, homelessness agenda that has moved at a staggering pace uh, from January onwards of this year when you consider um, the issues we had to deal with with regards to flooding and then latterly with C19, uh, the numbers uh, of homelessness have increased uh, day on day, week on week uh, and has become uh, a serious issue for us here in Shropshire, particularly around um, single uh, homelessness people who are uh, who previously have been accommodated in other people's houses if you like um, so they've surfaced and we now have an obligation to rehouse uh, rehouse those individuals so the issue around temporary accommodation and more permanent solutions is a huge one and will impact the council significantly so I think it's right that that comes at this time uh, and a lot of uh, as I say there's been a lot of changes over a very short period of time and I envisage we they they the horizon, the scenario will continue to change at that kind of pace going forwards. Just wanted to make those comments, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you, Andy. So if we can have Karen about the laptops and then I will briefly come back to you, Roger. OK. Need your mic on, Karen. Sorry, yeah, I know. I can't move the mouse quick enough. Um, so, um, Roger, I'm not um, aware of the meeting that you're referencing. So if you want to let me know what that is, I'm very happy to um, follow that up. In respect to the laptops, they're not allocated to schools, they're allocated to individual children. And clearly we've been going through a process to identify those children um, and those children most in need of a laptop. And clearly that's those children who haven't got a laptop. And more importantly, those who need a laptop with uh, built in uh, connectivity. Um, so um, that's the piece of work that um, we've done. We've had 500 laptops and that's uh, and, and we are about to start to distribute those and we're expecting those to go out um, early next week. Um, we did have receive laptop in boxes and clearly our IT team have had to set those up at a point in time when we're also very busy keeping in excess of two and a half thousand people live on the internet ro working remotely. So it's been a challenging time I think for everybody but those laptops will be out as soon as possible. Okay thank you very much Karen. So um, did you want to come back briefly Roger? Quick one. Um, I'm Com I'm complimenting our education and our IT. The meeting I was at yesterday was with a number of group leaders from other local authorities and the other, a number of other local authorities are reporting no information, no laptops, nothing. So my, my compliments that we are where, where we are and they are now starting to go out. Uh, as I say, a number of other lo local authorities are nowhere near where we are, but it is important and I'm sure that Karen and everybody else understands that there are a number of young people at home with no IT access and this is what those are for. So yeah and also finally LTP4, I may be wrong but I thought it was for the, it had to be 2021 year was the first year that it was going to cover. So September 21, yep yeah, maybe but I thought it also covered 2020-21 and then further on for the next following four years. Thank you. OK, Roger, so I, um, I'm just going to ask, is, does anybody else want to? Yeah, Cecilia wants to ask a, ask a quick question. I want to ask you a question, Cecilia. Yeah, uh, Karen, thank you. Uh, um, sorry, Claire. Um, it's 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 more a, a, a commentary actually on on this um, quarter four report. It, it seems to me that um, because of the way that we've all having to be, we've all been working um, ever since the COVID up, um, outbreak, 
And um, I absolutely um, endorse uh, Karen's remarks about the fact that our IT team have been quite incredible uh, uh, in the way that they've managed to get many people sorted out online. But it does seem to me that following on from this, um, and in particular, just looking at the, at the part of the report that, that relates to embracing our rurality and the local transport plan and all that, I think we may be having to look very closely at this again in a rather different context. Um, if we decide um, going forward that it, there may be benefit in more staff working remotely once the COVID threat has passed. Um, and so I think we need to be careful about not setting too much in stone at this particular point, um, because I think we're going to find uh, that we are going to be developing new ways of working at quite a pace. That's all I wanted to say. OK, thank you very much, Cecilia. So um, is there anybody else who would like to ask a question on the quarter four performance report? OK. What I suggest we do is that we actually note this report. Um, is everyone content that we note the report? Yep. Yes. Yep. 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 OK, so we will note we'll note the report and uh, and move on and thank all the officers for all their work. But obviously we are in a totally different place than we were when <laughs> when quarter four took place. OK, so thank you very much indeed. So we're going to move on now to item number eight, which is the future work programme. Uh, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself and um, present the item? Yes. Yes, of course I will. Hello, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'm Daniel Webb. I'm the Overview and Scrutiny Officer. I'm an, an Overview and Scrutiny Officer here at Shropshire Council. Um, We've, uh, I present to you here a draft work programme for the Performance and Management Scrutiny Committee for um, the rest of the year up to November. Um, this incorporates uh, changes requested at the previous meeting in May around reorganising some of the items and adding further items to the agenda. So uh, coming up in July, we would be looking at the financial matters uh, pertaining from the uh, coronavirus pandemic, which would fit quite nicely then with the, the quarter four finance report. Um, we also uh, intend to bring an item regarding the council's response to the climate emergency. And we also intend to look at highways performance reporting. Um, the highways performance reporting was originally down as care performance reporting, but following consultation with the uh, transport consultants, uh, I suggest that we broaden this out to highways performance reporting, which was indeed what was agreed at the place uh, overview committee in March. Um, I'd also like to note as well, just to answer what I suspect will be some of the questions from the members around uh, health scrutiny. Um, the with regards to uh, the joint HOSC, uh, I'm reading out here, so forgive me, if this doesn't quite make flow. The chairs are meeting regularly with senior officers from the NHS and are working towards holding a meeting in the near future. The date has yet to be set. Similarly, they are looking at arranging a meeting of the Health and Social Care Overview of the Screening Committee to identify relevant topics relating to their statutory role. Uh, what they're quite clear on doing is identifying the correct topics to add value, particularly with regards to the, the pressures uh, stemming from the, uh, from the pandemic. And, and the fact that things are very fast moving. So I think what they're really clear on doing here is that they don't add further pressure to an already highly pressurised system by holding meetings for the sake of it. They want the, the committee want to be absolutely clear that they've got a purpose for meeting. Um, obviously, this is all a draft work programme, so it's for you as members to agree going forward. If you've got any suggestions for change, um, now's your opportunity. Thank you, Claire. OK, thank you. Hey. If you want to do, uh, say something. Who, me? Yep. Hi, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I think um, it would be better with the health committee, but if they're not meeting, then somebody, um, it, it would be good to hear how Shropshire Councils, what their role is in track and trace testing um, and how that's sort of being delivered and, you know, is it working effectively? Is it doing everything it should do? What contingency planning is in place and all that sort of thing? It would sit better with health. So maybe that's a suggestion for them. But 
um, when we had the information come around as a bulletin that the sort of local authorities are going to be key to um, track and trace, um, I kind of thought, well, that would be really useful to know exactly how that's going to actually operate here in Shropshire. OK, thank you. Roger, you wanted to make a comment. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am getting requests to push this, and that is for a meeting of the uh, health, and, health and Social Care for Shropshire to meet. I understand the joint HOSC is meeting, and I'm being told, I'm being told third, fourth hand, that that is because Telford have pushed it, not Shropshire. And I think in Shropshire, because of the C19, there does need to be a meeting fairly urgently of it, or even maybe a Zoom meeting amongst the members to decide topics that they want. Waiting for the NHS or somebody to do something may be a little bit delayed. And I think with the, with the new responsibilities that the Dep uh, Director of Public Health now has uh, to care homes and the testing and the uh, on all that to do with care homes, I think an urgent meeting is held. Performance is the wrong committee to do it. We're not the experts in health, I'm not. There are others within this council who take a great interest in it. And I think for the res res residents of Shropshire, that meeting does need to be held in the near future. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Karen Calder to uh, answer that question. Are you there, Karen? Um, yes, um, thank you, Claire. Um, can I just please um, refute? I don't know where Roger got his information that it's Telford and Rekin that are pushing for the joint toss to come together. Can I reassure everybody that this is a joint push? We both recognise the importance of holding a joint HOSC. Uh, it, this is not um, a pressure that's been put le led from one um, authority on the other. So I just want to get put that out there. Also, can I say that I've been having uh, weekly meetings now with my my opposite number, Derek White, um, uh, for the last five, six weeks now. And we've been going through and we've had high level strategic meetings with um, uh, colleagues in the NHS uh, and, and we've been being kept up to date with the very, very fast paced piece of work around restoration and recovery that's going on at the moment. And as Daniel quite rightly pointed out, some of this work is is going at such a pace that it's changing quite literally daily. And so it is being able to focus in on a piece of work that both authorities and Shropshire could actually look at that would bring tangible answers. Um, to try and, and ask officers to bring forward reports on something that is changing daily is very, very difficult. But I just want to assure everybody that we are looking at bringing the health overview and scrutiny back into function as soon as possible. I think we've got our first date for the 20th of August. I've gone back to the officers and said, um, sorry, 20th of July. Um, and the first full meeting of the joint HOSC as um, diary just the 20th of August. I've gone back to the offices in both authorities and said that I don't think the 20th of August is good enough. We need to be doing something sooner than that. And I think we probably can. We're also probably going to have to be um, quite fleet and light of foot in some of the work that we do as we were when the Future Fit Programme Board was going through, work was going through. We we couldn't do the work in the time frames that were the originally allocated time frames, which is you know, every six weeks that we would meet. Sometimes we have to meet two every two weeks or, or so forth. And it might have to be that that's how we work from from now on. Um, but I just wanted to assure members that I am picking up um, the concerns around health, but uh, we, there has to be a degree of pragmatism in how we approach what items actually go onto the agenda. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, can Andy Begley, can you say a few words, please, Andy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just really to build on on some of those those comments uh, from Karen. Um, and I can I can confirm that none of this is being driven uh, from anywhere else in terms of those comments around Telford and Reeking or, or, or other partners. What I can confirm is as we've moved forward with this pandemic, uh, at the kind of pace that uh, Karen has described. Um, we have been working collectively as a system, which includes the geography of Telford and Reekin and the whole of Shropshire, uh, and working together with health, 
uh, social care partners across that geography, that combined geography, to make sure that we are doing the right things in the right order. Uh, it is a very, very quickly changing situation. Uh, we are getting new direction um, uh, uh, from national government, as you know, almost on a daily basis, and we're having to react to that. There are, as Roger says, um, revised and new responsibilities uh, that the, both the, the local authority has uh, and in particular director of public health uh, now has uh, and in terms of that we're working together to put uh, immediate put together uh, those um, public health protection boards uh, that's part of our responsibilities all this detail is being worked through at the moment this is, is being communicated as best we can again on if not a daily basis, certainly every other day there's new communication that we're putting out there. Um, and at the moment, um, th that's the position that we're in. We're working through this. We're trying to use our existing structures and those new structures that uh, it's an incumbent upon us to create. That is that is direction from national government. So all that is coming together uh, to make sure that we are addressing what needs to happen in times of a crisis while still maintaining hopefully our development work as uh, as described within those particular boards. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So um, I appreciate we've been going a long time now uh, and I want to just agree the agenda for the July meeting. So one of the things that I did think we might want to put on there is the send, send report, which was done a couple of months back now. Um, so I'd quite like to put that on there. We've got climate change and the finances. So we cut three items is absolute maximum. So Daniel, what what have we got? What have we got? We've got three items on there now at the moment, have we? Yeah, I would I would caution against adding more. I think if you're going to, I mean, looking no, at I this, there three, are three, three's enough, definitely. Well, you have four um, at the moment, actually, at the moment. So there's the COVID-19 financial matters, the quarter four finance report, climate change, highways performance reporting. I would be staggered if you got through half of that within two hours. I think you need to make a hard decision, actually, on what on, not on what, what you add, but what you take out. Alternatively, you could hold a further meeting in July or August. Claire, you're on mute, unfortunately. Chair? Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. A dog <laughs> just jumped up. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so if we have two meetings in July and we have two two items on each agenda, mm -hmm. I mean, that, makes more, that makes more sense, doesn't it? I think that would be far more realistic. So, so we'll have the climate change as well. We can fit the climate change in, can we? We can, yes. Yeah, OK. And if we leave that more to, to, towards the last meeting in July, simply because I think Dean sort of implied that he wanted a bit more time. So yep. we'll give them a bit more time. So we'll put theirs at the end of July. Is everyone happy with that? Are you happy with yes. that, Roger? Stuck yep. Stick the thumb up. Yeah. Yes, Chair. Yep. Fine, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. OK, so are we all sorted on what we're doing then? We're going to have two meetings in July. Two two items on each agenda. Yep. 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 OK. Uh, Claire, if I, if I might say, actually, if you could just leave the discretion with me on this instant on which order to put those in. Yep. I, okay. I only say that just in terms of office availability, that's all. I just assume that we've got the best fit and the time to make sure we look at everything properly. OK, that's yeah. absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Thanks, so, Jim. OK, so I'm going to draw the meeting to a close now, I think. So if you can take us off air, whoever's on air, unless anybody else has anything else they wish to say. Bye bye. No, OK. Thank you very much indeed. Would you like to take us off air, Tim?